the massive continent that is being lived in, the power of the empire that dominate the continent are divided into four forces. The meritorious family that the Golden Lion raised, representing martial arts and swordsmanship, the Great Lion family. The force made up of a gathering of devotees and priests that worship countless avatars across the continent, the Protestant Alliance. The information gathering group that protects the imperial family from the shadows, the inspection bureau, and the magic force that has led the world of magic for over a thousand years, the magic tower. The prestigious magic family that nourished that magic tower and the world of magic is his family, the Malvinger family. Thirty years ago, as the war with the demons broke out, his family became the spearhead that won the war. However, the majority of the family was sacrificed, and when he turned eight years old, his father who suffered from the aftermaths of the war, and his mother who was his magic teacher, passed away. The only ones left in his family was him and his older sister. The vassal families that serve his family all betrayed him, seeing that he swore that he would become a great magician and restore the family. That was the plan, but since people started calling him the disgrace of the Malvinger family due to the rare condition blockage disease, he could not use magic. Forget restoring his family, he became the laughing stock of the entire world. He worked to death to try to treat the blockage disease, but he could not find a way. But then to his surprise his wish probably reached the heavens, he met a dragon. The only possibility that he has to raise his collapsed family back again is right in front of his eyes. The one who will free him from this tiresome seal, his new vessel, has now become one with him to take over the human world. If he knew that it was the test of the demon king, he would have never sought out something like dragon. But he, Elric Malvinger, will not be devoured like this. Helric Malvinger is currently facing a debilitating condition known as blockage disease, a rare ailment that hinders the free flow of mana in his body, preventing him from using magic like ordinary people. Despite the efforts of the attendants at the Royal Magic Hospital, they informed Elric that there seems to be no cure for his condition. One day at the talking booth in Nustin Academy, Elric is speaking to his sister. She inquires about his health, wondering if the doctors found a cure. Concerned, she offers him financial help if needed. However, Elric reassures her, asking her not to worry excessively as he is no longer a child and believes he will be cured soon. His sister insists on her concern, pointing out that she is the only family he has left. Elric, trying to shield her from his inner fears, evades sharing the full truth, telling her he has to attend to his friend's call and promises to call her back. With a heavy heart, he ends the call unable to bring himself to admit the possibility that he may not be able to return home. At the academy, the results are posted, and students gather to discuss their grades. Some express frustration, mentioning that despite their punctuality in attending Professor Barak's class, they still received a disappointing D grade. However, their attention shifts to Elric's grades, and they admire his consistency, considering him exceptional. Though Elric has outstanding A-plus grades in four theory exams, it's not enough to pass, as he received a failing F grade in the remaining three practical exams. This marks his fourth consecutive failure, a situation that could lead to expulsion according to the Academy's rules. Elric worries about the consequences of expulsion, as it would prevent him from bringing honor to his family. Despite putting in his best effort to study, he is still not able to stay in the Academy and avoid being expelled. As a result of his efforts, he fully grasped all the Academy's required logic, excelling in theory exams effortlessly. He had always believed he was special, not only due to his intelligence, but also his exceptional ability to detect and understand mana, a skill highly coveted by magicians. These talents, encompassing both theory and mana abilities, were enviable traits for any magician. However, during practical exercises, he encountered a significant hurdle. Once he was asked to absorb mana from the air in his heart and form a circle, a crucial magical technique, Despite possessing the desired talent, his blockage disease prevented him from utilizing magic effectively. His classmates observed his struggles and couldn't comprehend why a magician couldn't even perform a basic circle in a first-year class. Faced with skepticism, his teacher questioned why he didn't consider abandoning magic and pursuing to become a scholar instead. Due to his disease, Elric's dreams of becoming a magician were shattered, leaving him with only one path to become a magic scholar. However, this profession felt inadequate for him to bring glory to his esteemed family. In search of solace, Elric sought comfort in the garden of the academy, where a statue of his grandfather, Buston Malvinger, the heroic magician of the Great Demon War, stood tall. 
It was his grandfather who had founded the prestigious Buzden Academy, the nation's finest magic school. As Elric stood before the statue, two boys nearby made hurtful comments about him. They expressed disbelief that someone like Elric could be the grandson of the Academy's revered first headmaster, stating that it was a disgrace to the Maldinger family. They further questioned how far a magic royal family could fall. Elric approaches the two boys from behind and inquires whether they are first-year students in the physical magic department and do they know Scene. Confirming their status, they acknowledge that they know an assistant professor named Scene. Elric claims Scene is a very close friend, but the boys doubt that someone like Elric could be friends with Scene, given his personality. Elric challenges them to wait and see, leaving them behind. On his way, Elric gazes at his grandfather's statue, reminiscing about his grandfather and even his late father. He pushes away these thoughts, reminding himself to stay focused and determined to overcome his cursed body. Later, Elric sits outside a cafe, examining his first report from the academy and realizing there's no mention of his blockage disease. Suddenly, an enraged individual approaches him and forcefully strikes Elric's head on the table from behind. The surrounding people become fearful witnessing the scene. The person responsible for the attack is Seen Narister, the third son of the Narister family. Seen confronts Elric, accusing him of using his name without permission. Elric stands up with a friendly greeting, calling Seen the great and friendly Seen Narister. Seen is not amused and demands Elric to stop using his name to deceive others. Eventually, they both sit at the table, and Elric agrees to stop the deception, playfully asking Seen for a drink and even jokingly requesting a magic nose job. Annoyed, Seen firmly declines, wondering if he may have hit Elric too hard during their encounter. After Elric's family faced downfall, the Magic Tower came under the leadership of six families known as the Hexagram. Seen is a member of one of these families, the Narister family, and he graduated early from the academy, aspiring to become a professor. Elric sees Seen as an elite and appreciates the fact that Seen has been supportive and stood by his side despite their totally opposite paths. With a broad smile, Elric recalls Scene's all this, and this catches Scene's attention. Scene, slightly annoyed by the smile, wonders what is wrong with Elric, pushes some papers towards him, who curiously begins reading them. To his astonishment, the papers contain a diamond dragon exploration plan. Scene explains that a recently discovered ancient species, the diamond dragons, has been found nesting nearby. Scene invites Elric to join the expedition crew, which surprises him. These dragons, believed to be the source of all magic, were thought to be extinct, but the discovery of their nest presents a unique opportunity. Seen reveals that if Elric happens to find an artifact during the expedition, the Academy might overlook his expulsion. With a hint of humor, Seen takes credit for this opportunity. Elric contemplates the prospect of finding something in the dragon's nest that could cure his blockage disease, but he soon becomes disheartened, realizing that any discovery would likely be taken by the Dean anyway. However, a sudden realization sparks determination within him. Elric slams the papers on the table and stands up, understanding that this is an extraordinary chance given to him by the heavens. He bursts into loud laughter, much to Scene's annoyance, who demands an explanation for Elric's behavior. Elric smirks widely and indicates a specific spot on the map, confidently informing Scene that right there, no nest exists. Elric points confidently at a spot on the map and assures Scene that the nest won't be there. Scene, taken aback, questions Elric in disbelief and gazes around to make sure no one is overhearing them. Speaking in a hushed tone, Scene advises Elric to be more cautious and questions whether he realizes how many professors they are challenging at once. Scene emphasizes that they are going against all those formidable figures. Unperturbed, Elric leans back in his chair and maintains that it's the truth. Seen, visibly upset, threatens to hit Elric on the head again. Elric calmly reminds Seen to remember his noble heritage as a son of the Narister family and to act accordingly. Sighing, Seen begins using magic with his hand on the map, urging Elric to listen to him first. As Seen's magic transports them inside the map, he proceeds to explain everything to Elric, illustrating the crack formed by the collision of two strata and the massive flow of mana emanating from it. Elric takes a careful look and deduces that such an accumulation would have taken at least 100,000 years. Realizing this, Elric logically concludes that it's no surprise Seen believed the dragon's nest would be located here. Standing on the edge of the crack, Elric playfully asks Seen to recall the three principles of the mana stream. 
Irritated, Seen questions if Elric is mocking him. Elric teasingly responds, stating that of course, Seen, being an assistant professor, must be familiar with the basics. Seen recites the principles, from high to low, from wide to narrow, from hot to cold. Elric agrees that based on these principles, they all must have been convinced this was the dragon's nest. However, he points towards the end of the crack inside the map and explains that because of the presence of very hot magma flowing through those cracks, mana cannot accumulate there, making it an unsuitable habitat for a dragon. Seen, enraged, refuses to accept this explanation, insisting that it can't be true. Elric suddenly has a realization that the magma from the Akran volcano flows beneath the continent. Seen adds that they have even recorded the mana wavelengths of a dragon in the vicinity, leaving no doubt that the dragon's nest is indeed in the area. Sitting back at their table, Elric innocently clarifies that he never said there wasn't a nest. He acknowledges that there is definitely a nest. He points at a specific spot on the map and confidently states that the dragon's nest will undoubtedly be found right there, within the Karagal cave. Standing outside the dean's office, Seen is visibly confused about how to approach the higher-ups with the information he and Elric have discovered. He contemplates knocking on the door, but hesitates, wondering if playing dumb might be a safer option. However, he worries about the consequences of upsetting the dean, knowing he could be dismissed or punished. In the midst of this, Seen notices Elric outside the training room, practicing his magic. He wonders why he is alone there. Elric seems lost in thought, with everything from his expulsion to his grandfather's legacy and aspirations to become the best running through his mind simultaneously. He is trying to use his magic, but that blockage disease is hindering his progress. Seeing Elric struggling, Seen considers the possibility that Elric might have the ability to cure his blockage disease. Deciding to help his friend, Seen resolves to be there for Elric. Inside the office of Ustan Academy's dean, Barrex, he is reading a newspaper when Seen enters to discuss the research report. Dean questions Seen, asking if he is implying that the dean's research report is incorrect. Seen clarifies that he was merely seeking the dean's opinion, as there is a possibility that something else might be at play. The dean, while acknowledging that he doesn't understand how Seen arrived at this conclusion, warns Seen that if he fails to convince him, even his status as the son of the Narister family won't protect him from consequences. Seen senses a tremendous surge of mana emanating from the Dean, realizing that it is power of a Seventh Circle magician. Unexpectedly, Elric opens the door to the Dean's office and walks in. Seen is baffled by Elric's actions and questions his sanity, wondering why he would enter the Dean's office without permission. Elric politely greets the Dean and apologizes for his uninvited entrance. The dean addresses Elric and inquires if the deduction was his opinion. Elric confirms that it was indeed his opinion. The dean applauds Elric for his insight, noting that it's remarkable for a student to think of something like that. However, he questions Elric about the lack of concrete evidence behind the deduction, pointing out that it appears to be merely a guess. Elric confidently tells Dean that his deduction is a basic truth that even a three-year-old would understand. He challenges the dean by asking if he still requires concrete evidence for such a simple fact. Seen is taken aback and wonders why Elric is taunting the dean, fearing that Elric might be jeopardizing their situation. Dean, feeling overwhelmed by the audacity of someone who can't even condense mana properly, finds himself laughing uncontrollably at Elric's words. He puts his head in his hands, struggling to find the right response. Unbothered, Elric asks the Dean directly if he is saying that his guess is wrong. Dean concedes that there are a few individuals who stumble upon strokes of luck, but he refers to those who speak without knowing their place as trash, seemingly referring to Elric. Despite this, the Dean acknowledges that, as a professor, he cannot outright ignore a student's opinion. So he proposes a bet to Elric. He offers to provide all the necessary resources for Elric to form an exploration team. However, if Elric fails to prove his deduction, he must risk a valuable heirloom that the first headmaster left behind. In the carriage, Seen and Elric are seated, and Seen's anger towards Elric is evident. Elric asks Seen to keep it down, as his ears are on the verge of falling off. Elric continues reading his book, almost lying flat on his seat, and casually remarks that it's fine since they agreed not to hold him back if he finds the dragon's nest. Seen, in frustration, snatches the book from Elric's hand. Elric protests, mentioning that the book was getting interesting, but Seen interrupts him, 
expressing his concern about what will happen if Elric's predictions turn out to be wrong. He reminds Elric that in that case, Elric's family heirloom will be taken away. Elric glances at the pendant he is wearing, an heirloom reserved for the head of the Maldinger family. Elric nonchalantly responds, pointing out that the dean has long desired the pendant for himself. C notices Elric's laughter and asks if he comprehends the seriousness of the situation. In response, Elric thanks Seen for standing by his side throughout this ordeal. Seen, feeling the weight of the situation, places his head in his hands and questions Elric about his plans. Elric sits up straight and affectionately addresses Seen as my dear friend, then asks if Seen truly believes he accepted the bet merely to avoid being held back. Perplexed, Seen asks Elric to explain. Elric clarifies that if the dean dared to covet the Maldinger family heirloom, he should have staked his life as the dean in addition to the pendant. Seen had overlooked the fact that Elric was known by two nicknames, one that labeled him as the disgrace of the Maldinger family, and another that branded him as the worst of the Maldinger family. Seen's mind wanders back to a distressing memory from seven years ago, when he was a freshman at Uston Academy. At that time, Elric was just 15 years old and found himself isolated, sitting separately from everyone else. A group of classmates, led by a student named Rivern, approached him and started mocking him. Rivern taunted Elric, asking if he was really worthy of the Malvinger name, and questioned if he was possibly plucked off the streets by the headmaster. Their cruel words hurt Elric deeply. Feeling humiliated, Elric couldn't bear the insults any longer and impulsively struck Rivern with a crystal ball, causing him to fall to the ground. This act caught the attention of Uston Academy's disciplinary committee, and Elric had to face the consequences. During the hearing, Elric stood before the committee members and defended himself by stating that he, as the head of a Duke family, had the right to punish someone from a Viscount family who had dared to insult him. He questioned if there was any issue with him acting within the laws of the Empire. After much deliberation, the committee decided to suspend Elric as the Academy's rules dictated that all students were to be treated equally. However, from that day onwards, nobody dared to lay a finger on Elric again. Seen looks down at the book he just snatched from Elric's hands and becomes furious with Elric for reading a forbidden book and demands to know what he is thinking. Elric admits that the book is indeed forbidden, and if he's caught with it, he might face severe consequences, possibly even being burned at the stake. Seen returns the book to Elric, calling him crazy and questioning his intentions in learning the Beast King's body strengthening arts. Elric explains that he was curious if the arts could potentially help treat blockage disease. He recounts the history of the Beast King's invasion of the Empire with his army of beastmen, who possessed remarkable physical abilities due to the body strengthening arts. However, these arts were lost when the Empire drove out the beast kind and beastmen, and scholars had failed to recover them. To Seen's astonishment, Elric claims to have recovered the lost arts, although he has no idea how to apply them to his body. This revelation leaves Seen shocked once again. The two of them start arguing as they grow increasingly frustrated with each other. Suddenly, the carriage comes to a stop, prompting them to step outside to investigate the issue. A group of boys approaches Elric and Seen, greeting Elric with a long time no see. Elric is surprised to see them there and asks why they are present. Rivern replies, stating that it's because he cares about his fellow classmates. Rivern is now a senior researcher at the Barracks Research Institute. Seen scolds them, but they seem puzzled and explained that the dean asked them to assist Seen and Elric. Elric can't help but mockingly remark how nice it is of Dean Barracks to send them even though Elric had told him he didn't need any help. In response, Seen secretly asks Elric to check how many of the boys are hiding their mana, as Elric has the ability to sense it. Elric confirms that this seems more like Dean Barak's style and reassures Seen not to worry because he has something prepared. He then opens his shirt, revealing something that leaves Seen in shock, and he asks Elric how he obtained this. Dean is taken aback when River returns to his office and informs him that Elric took Gehenna's breath and the Azure Sky Lord armor. Rivern explains that they lent these powerful four-star magic equipment items to Elric because the Dean had asked them to help Elric as much as possible. Gehenna's breath is a gourd containing hellfire that burns until the target is reduced to ashes, while the Azure Sky Lord armor is an armor with exceptional resistance against both physical attacks and elemental magics. The Dean scolds Rivern for allowing a student, especially Elric, to have access to such dangerous and potent equipment capable of causing massive destruction.
The dean is frustrated and dismisses Rivern, not wanting to see his face anymore. He quickly leaves the office, worried about the potential consequences if other candidates find out. The dean realizes that Elric's actions could cause a stir. Nevertheless, he acknowledges that perhaps Elric's bloodline is playing a role in his choices. The dean contemplates replacing the incompetent scholars who overlooked basic matters that even a student would notice. Evil thoughts cross the dean's mind as he plans to exploit the situation to obtain the magic pendant, which he believes will secure his position as the next headmaster. He crumples the newspaper in his hand, knowing that although Elric won the bet, victory will only be assured if Elric makes it out alive. Elric remains absorbed in reading his book as Rivern and his group stand beside him, observing him. Meanwhile, Scene activates his magic, mana search, and realizes that Elric was indeed correct. Rivern acknowledges the truth and confirms that it was truly there. Elric confidently affirms that he knew it all along and urgently calls out to the expedition team, urging them to move quickly before the pillar of light disappears. Scene quickly lifts Elric, despite his embarrassment, to make a swift escape. Utilizing Scene's magical abilities, they fly away, leaving Rivern and his boys behind. The boys call out after them, asking what about them. Rivern and his boys manage to catch up with Elric and Seen after a strenuous climb. They request Elric and Seen to wait for them. Elric taunts them, asking why they are so exhausted. When they all reach the top, they are shocked to find nothing there, not even a cave. Rivern questions Elric, doubting that the dragon's nest could be in such an open area. One of the boys by Rivern's side adds that Malvinger always brings bad results anyway. Mockingly, Rivern asks Elric if they can now proceed with their earlier threat of breaking open his skull. He cheekily suggests that someone should compensate them for their troubles as well. Elric suddenly calls out for Scene's assistance, requesting him to create a wide hole. Scene complies, activating his flare magic to dig a massive hole in the ground. Finally, they discover something, and Scene announces that he has found it. One of Rivern's boys starts to ask a question. But before he can finish, they are met with a massive explosion of mana. Everyone tries to avoid the outburst of mana, but Elric assures them not to be frightened, explaining that it's just the pent-up mana that flowed out when they created the hole. Elric orders everyone to enter the hole. Everyone follows Elric. When they reach the bottom of the hole, the expedition team members are puzzled by the intense cold in the area. Despite using spells to warm themselves up, Elric notices something and comes to a stop prompting Scene to inquire if he sees anything. Elric replies that he didn't see anything specific, but had a chilling sensation down his spine. Scene attributes it to Elric feeling cold. As they continue, a creature with a red eye notices them and exclaims that they have finally arrived. However, Elric and the team members are unable to hear it. Eventually, they come across a massive door adorned with a dragon seal imprint. One of the team members suggests gathering everyone strong to try and push the door open, while another proposes using magic to break it open. As they experiment with different approaches, Elric calls for them to stop. Curious, they all turn to him to ask what happened. Elric points out that the door bears the seal of a dragon, and they have no idea what might happen if they proceed recklessly. Rivern becomes annoyed by Elric's caution, believing he's merely showing off once again, which annoys him. While Elric is advising everyone to be cautious and not take any independent actions when trying to open the door, River notices something on the door's surface. He sits on the ground and checks the material of the door, wondering if it is gold or something else. Elric suddenly notices River and urgently shouts at him to not touch it. Before River can ask what Elric is talking about, he inadvertently touches the door, triggering a massive explosion behind him. Elric screams for everyone to be careful, warning them that it was a trap. The expedition team quickly activates their shields to protect themselves from the effects of the explosion. Scene asks Elric about their next move, and Elric explains that he will try to decrypt the text on the door. The panicked team members plead with Elric to save them, but he urges them to stay calm. Elric enters a state of darkness and solitude, focusing on decrypting the text to find a solution. He views it as a test problem and has faith in himself to find the answer. Others struggle to block the explosion's fire and continue to plead for salvation. Elric scribbles something on paper. He asks them to wait a little longer and assures them that he won't make any mistakes. He decides to press the specific area again, hoping it's the right move to progress safely. Elric nervously presses that specific part of the door again, hoping it was the right move to stop the explosion. 
Miraculously, the explosion fire ceases, much to the relief of the expedition team who thought they were going to die. They express their gratitude to Elric for saving them, and some of the members are still suffering from the after-effects, sitting on the bird ground. They try to comfort each other, assuring that they will be healed soon, although one of them remarks that it might have shortened their lifespan. Seam looks at Elric in awe and acknowledges his extraordinary abilities. Elric smiles and credits his power for their survival. Suddenly, a crystal bullet is shot, killing one of the team members instantly. Everyone is stunned and wonders what just happened. Elric looks up to see a barrage of crystal bullets raining down on them. The team members quickly activate their shields once again to protect themselves from the deadly assault. Elric starts scribbling on his paper once more, desperately trying to find a way to deal with this new threat. Seen urges him to hurry, and then a realization strikes Elric. He comes to understand that this is the origin of magic, a dragon's dragon tongue magic. Seen informs Elric that he is finding it difficult to maintain the shield any longer. Elric, in response, activates the Azure Sky Lord armor, surprising Seen, who wonders how Elric possesses such a powerful item. Elric confidently presses the specific part of the door again, assuring that it will work this time. To their relief, the shield disappears, and the crystal bullet that was about to hit Seen disintegrates, neutralizing the trap. Exhausted and relieved, Elric collapses to the ground, sighing with the realization that he thought he was going to die. His clothes are torn from the ordeal. As the door opens, a radiant golden light shines from within. Elric instructs the exploration team to assist the injured members and enter. Inside, they discover treasure, books, and numerous magic tools. Among the findings is a remarkable armor made of dragon scales. Elric realizes that this place contains a collection of preserved ancient books. A team member acknowledges Elric's ingenuity, appreciating his leadership as a magician at heart. Elric becomes nervous at the unexpected praise. Seen approaches Elric, putting his arm over his shoulder, and asks him what he did earlier. Elric explains that he, after all, got a perfect score in theory tests. He reveals that he perceived the traps as tests, solved their composition from a geometrical perspective, and applied the elemental theory to overcome them successfully. As Elric enjoys the moment of triumph, he suddenly feels a sense of strangeness, as if he's being given practice questions before a test. C notices Elric's deep contemplation and asks him what's on his mind. Elric brushes it off, saying it's nothing. Seen places his hand on Elric's shoulder and tells him that he should be smiling on such a momentous day, as from now on, no one will be able to ignore him or his prestigious magical family. Though still bothered by his previous thoughts, Ulrich decides to focus on enjoying the newfound freedom he has gained. Meanwhile, Rivern is engrossed in searching for expensive gems among the treasures. Another team member approaches Elric and informs him about a laboratory nearby, urging him to check it out. Elric is dragged along to explore the laboratory, and Seen, observing how Elric is being called a leader and realizing that he has grown up, decides to follow them. However, Rivern calls Seen from behind and points out a dragon corpse hidden behind a mountain of treasure. Excitedly, Seen tries to call Elric to share the discovery, but Rivern interrupts him, saying they can inform Elric later and suggests they leave for now. Seen examines the massive dragon corpse and deduces that it is of Dragon King rank due to its size. Rivern adds that it seems to have been lying here for more than 4,000 years. Meanwhile, that team member along with others throw Elric to the ground and surround him. Elric is puzzled by their behavior, thinking that he let his guard down because he was excited. One of the men tells Elric that their actions are not out of spite, as they actually like him, but their duty comes first. Amidst this, C notices the dragon corpse moving and asks River if he saw it too. On the other hand, Elric wonders where the rest of the team is, imagining them enjoying their time exploring the treasure. The man who confronted Elric grabs him by the collar, and Elric calls for help, feeling regretful for having trusted anyone. However, before the man can attack Elric with fire magic, a sudden attack severs the man's hand, and it falls to the ground. Elric looks in the direction of the attack and realizes that the awakened dragon corpse has come to his rescue. Elric's attention is drawn to a startling sight, a living dragon corpse standing before him. He urges himself to remain composed, recognizing that this is also a test. Taking charge, Elric instructs everyone to avoid the dragon while staying alive. As he observes the motionless dragon, he wonders about the reason behind its stillness. His mind races, 
Contemplating the nature of dragon tongue magic, the incredible nature of dragons, and potential reasons for the dragon's behavior. Casting delay, origin. Eventually, he concludes that using a breath consecutively requires some preparation time, leading to a considerable power consumption. Addressing the expedition party, Elric commands them to regroup and form a defensive shield. Swiftly, they raise their shields and take their positions, bracing for the impending danger. As the dragon's breath approaches, fear grips them all, but they stand resolute. Alric realizes that the breath will persist for approximately 20 seconds, and if they can endure this onslaught, they might have a chance to survive. With determination, they hold their shields with all their might. Alric's mind races, and a crucial realization dawns on him. Reaching the door will take 17 seconds, and if they can shut it in just 3 seconds, their survival is within reach. However, the sudden breaking of their shield fills him with dread, and he urgently warns everyone to run for their lives. Amidst the chaos, drops of blood fall on Elric's face, causing him to pause and look up. There, before his eyes, stands the legendary guardian beings said to protect the dragon, the Spardoi, as a firebomb hurtles towards him. Elric is momentarily paralyzed by the sight of the Spardoi's presence. Scene's call snaps Elric back to reality, urging him to gather himself. Elric realizes that he must find a solution and instinctively pleads for help in a low voice. Yet, deep down, he understands that the answers lie within himself, for every problem has a solution. Placing his hand on his forehead, Elric attempts to focus more clearly. When he opens his eyes again, he is greeted by a peculiar sight. Everything appears as a network of lines, resembling spiderwebs. Confused by this new perspective, Elric wonders why everything has taken on such an appearance. Although Scene tries to communicate with him, Elric finds himself unable to hear his words. Suddenly, a Sparodi launches an attack, but Elric manages to evade it almost effortlessly, surprising himself. He begins to grasp that he can see different spots that predict the Sparodi's movements, where they will go, how he should dodge, and where they will strike. It dawns on Elric that by following these spots, he can ensure his safety. But in Elric's mind, doubt creeps in as he considers the possibility of it all being a trap. However, he glances around at his companions, witnessing their misery as they struggle to stay alive, realizing that there is no time to overthink. Elric knows that if they continue on this path, their efforts will be in vain, and they may not survive. So, Elric takes charge and issues orders to the group, urging them to follow him. He runs towards the way he can see, guiding everyone to dodge the attacks with well-timed ducks and jumps. Strategically, he instructs Seen to target the left leg of the Sparodi with a fireball, and Seen acts swiftly. Finally, they reach the door. The group is eager to cross the threshold, believing that safety awaits them on the other side once the door is shut. However, just as Elric is about to step through, Rivern falls, crying out for help. Elric faces a heart-wrenching dilemma. If he wants to close the door and ensure the group's safety, he must leave Rivern behind. Yet, as Sparodi closes in on fallen Rivern, Elric realizes that he cannot abandon him to die alone. Despite the risk, Elric rushes back to Rivern. As Sparodi prepares to attack Rivern, Elric acts quickly and pulls him away from the door to safety. Surprisingly, Sparodi doesn't follow them, leading Elric to realize that these beings cannot leave the area. Elric also wonders if there were other intruders in the vicinity, possibly responsible for the damage atop the dragon's lair. His thoughts are interrupted by memories of the dragon's corpse and the peculiar stone on its head. The pieces of the puzzle start to come together in his mind. Suddenly, the group spots Sparodi approaching once again, prompting everyone to flee in fear for their lives while simultaneously attempting to close the door behind them. Contrary to the others, Elric walks towards the door and boldly enters inside. He instructs the rest of the group to continue running without him. Seen, concerned for his friend's safety, yells at Elric, questioning his sanity, and rushes to save him. However, the door shuts between them, leaving Seen on one side and Elric on the other. Seen, filled with hope, starts knocking on the door in an attempt to coax Elric out. Memories from seven years ago come flooding back. After Elric's suspension, Seen found Elric sitting alone on the floor. Seen approached him and introduced himself as Seen Narrister, asking if they could be friends. However, Elric's response shocked Seen as he harshly told him to go away. Undeterred, Seen tried again at a later time when he spotted Elric in the library, engrossed in a book. Approaching him once more, Seen extended his hand for a handshake, 
reiterating his desire to be friends, but Elric's response remained unchanged. He told Seen to go away. Once again, throughout various attempts, Seen continued to ask Elric, but the same dismissive response became routine. On a starry night, Elric's teacher gathers the entire class in an open field and imparts an important lesson about becoming true magicians. They must possess tenacious stamina. The teacher explains that they will be awarded points based on the order of their arrival at the destination, encouraging them to move diligently. However, using magic during the test would lead to disqualification. With this, the teacher signals the beginning of the challenge, and the students rush towards their respective goals. Scene speeds up a mountain, realizing halfway up that he should have made sure to bring Elric along with him. As he turns back, a misstep causes him to trip and tumble dangerously close to the edge. Scene desperately clings to a single stone, barely hanging on and calls for help. Rivern and his friends approach Scene, wondering why he's struggling when he could easily use magic to ascend. Struggling to hold on, Scene confesses that he doesn't know how much longer he can endure. The temptation to use magic to save himself and get disqualified crosses his mind, but he hesitates, considering how it would make him feel when facing his father. Suddenly, a helping hand reaches out and grips Scene's, pulling him upward with great effort. It's Elric, determined to bring Scene back to safety. Elric urges Scene to hold on tight as he strains to bring him up successfully rescuing his friend from the precarious situation. Both of them take a moment to catch their breath, and Seen, now sitting with one shoe removed and a possibly fractured foot, feels grateful but guilty for making Elric late. Elric notices Seen's injured foot and offers his assistance, helping him get up and supporting him by carrying him on his shoulder. Seen protests, telling Elric to go ahead without him, but Elric reminds him of the friendship he had desired. Seen blushes in surprise at Elric's sincerity. Before Seen can say anything, Elric playfully dismisses the topic and requests some artifacts that Seen has at home. Elric jokingly asks if that much reward is acceptable between friends. Together, they continue on their journey. Seen teases Elric, asking if he's trying to scam his friend, to which Elric retorts that it's only fair since he saved Seen from falling. In a lighthearted moment, Elric compliments Seen's messy hair suggesting he should let it down more often. But Scene takes pride in his bangs pulled backwards and tells Elric to stop teasing him. They banter like this, enjoying each other's company as they walk on. As Scene regains his sense of where he is, he finds himself standing outside that closed door, wondering about Elric's determination to protect someone despite himself being weak. Scene shouts from outside, urging Elric to wait as he plans to call his family's elders or at least his father to come and help. He rushes to bring them. Meanwhile, on the inside of the door, Elric is grateful for Scene's concern, but explains that it's precisely because he cares for Scene's safety that he made the decision to go on alone. Elric looks up at and sees Dragon's corpse and the army of Spirodi ready to attack. Elric skillfully dodges every incoming attack as he marches towards the armament. As he reaches it, he firmly grasps the armament, declaring that what goes around comes around. Facing the Dragon's corpse and its army, Elric challenges them asking if they now desire a taste of their own medicine. Elric grabs the armament, an artifact typically requiring mana to be activated. However, he manages to unlock it and chooses to use his own lifespan as a substitute for mana. The armament unleashes a fiery force that engulfs the Sparotis, causing them to burn. Realizing that this entire ordeal is a test set up by the dragon, Elric speculates that the answer lies within the lance resting atop the dragon's corpse. Without hesitation, Elric jumps and lands on the dragon's head, convinced that the lance holds the key to the test solution. Though he knows that failure might mean his demise, he is unwavering in his determination. The Sparotis desperately try to obstruct him, but Elric ignores the danger and firmly grasps the lance embedded in the corpse's head, pulling it out. Suddenly, an explosion occurs, leaving Elric confused and disoriented when he opens his eyes. He cannot comprehend the outcome of his actions. A creature is gazing at Elric, he notices an immense amount of mana emanating from it. Initially, he thinks it might be an eight-circle sage, but he quickly corrects himself, realizing that its power surpasses even that level. Elric suddenly grasps that this very creature is the one responsible for killing the dragon. In a moment of clarity, Elric finally understands that this creature, the Vessel, holds the key to breaking the tiresome seal that binds him. Vessel offers Elric an enticing proposition to merge with him and conquer the world together. 
The overwhelming decision leaves Elric standing there in confusion. Then, a revelation strikes Elric. Behind Vessel, there is the demon king Mephistopheles. The demon king claims that Elric will be buried with him, adding to Elric's astonishment. Vessel reveals that the demon king is actually named Shinek and explains that although they were sealed together a thousand years ago, this time, the circumstances are different. As the pieces of the puzzle come together, Elric realizes that this was not merely a test from a dragon, but a trap set by a powerful demon king. As Elric kneels before the powerful vessel, he is racked with excruciating pain, emitting black smoke from his mouth. He wonders if this will be the end. The mana emanating from Shine only serves to strengthen the vessel. Memories of his family sacrifices flood Elric's mind. His grandfather and other family members gave their lives during the Great Demon War to repel the demons. Even after his parents passed away, leaving only him and his young older sister, they faced extinction, surrounded by treachery and betrayal. The Imperial family, the Magic Tower, and the Vassal families revealed their sinister intentions, driven by their disgusting desires. Even the person Elric once trusted and relied on the most attempted to seize what rightfully belonged to them. When Elric tried to protect his family's honor and legacy, that person abandoned them. Here in front of Vessel, Elric in his pitiful state is determined not to give up. Despite being harassed by Vessel, he clings to his resolve to overcome his blockage disease, restore his family's honor, and make those who betrayed him and his sister regret their actions. Suddenly, darkness surrounds him. Elric lets out a desperate scream, refusing to accept such an ending when he feels he has barely even begun his journey. Summoning a newfound power, he declares that a Malvinger will not be devoured by his enemies. This unexpected surge of strength infuriates Vessel, who is taken aback. Elric confidently announces that, as planned, the first demon to be swallowed will be right here and now. With a swift and decisive gesture, Elric initiates a special move, leaving Vessel filled with regret. Elric proclaims that in this very place, as part of the plan, the first demon will be defeated. However, as he looks around, he finds himself in a strange and bewildering location where nothing seems to make sense. There stands a figure that appears oddly familiar to Elric, though he cannot place where he might have encountered this person before. The figure reveals that he used to be nothing more than a group of scholars driven by the pursuit of reaching the pinnacle of magic. Elric struggles to recall where he has heard this voice previously. The figure goes on to explain that their insatiable desire for even greater power led them to be corrupted by demons, resulting in causing harm to the world. However, having realized his mistake, he resolved to make amends and created a family within this world as a way of setting things right. Elric begins to question if this figure might be a demon king, but upon closer consideration, he comes to the realization that it is actually a demon avatar. The Avatar continues, revealing that he created a family with the sole purpose of uprooting demons and eradicating them from their core. It is the duty of this family to relentlessly pursue and eliminate demons. However, the Avatar acknowledges that demons will never truly vanish, they will always resurface. He explains to Elric that demons must be devoured repeatedly, and until then, his family will not disband. The Avatar adds that in the distant future, his descendants will fully inherit his resolve. Elric suddenly realizes that the Avatar is fading away and he shouts out a warning. However, in the blink of an eye, he wakes up from his slumber, finding himself in bed. Beside him, Seen sits with his face turned away. Elric notices that Seen seems upset but denies crying when asked. However, Elric is pretty sure that Seen was indeed crying. Playfully teasing him, Elric reassures Seen that it's okay to cry and reminds him of a previous occasion when he saw Seen crying in the nest. Seen glares at Elric with annoyance, and Elric immediately apologizes for his teasing. Changing the topic, Elric asks if Seen brought a rescue squad to save him. Seen confirms that he did indeed call for help. Seen then hands Elric an egg to place on his bruise, and Elric questions why Seen doesn't just use magic to treat the bruise. Seen retorts that Elric should be grateful for getting anything at all, and jokingly scolds him with a curse word. Elric, trying to avoid any more confrontation, reminds Seen that he is the head of a family and shouldn't use such language. However, Seen interrupts him, pretending to be unaware of what he is saying. Elric quickly drops the topic and brushes it off. Suddenly, Seen changes his tone and threatens Elric, warning him not to do anything dangerous again. 
Then, Scene asks Elric to stand up without providing an explanation. Elric questions the reason for standing, but Scene remains silent and insists once more for him to stand up, to which Elric complies. Scene measures Elric's height against his own. He notices that Elric has grown taller. He urges Elric to take a look in the mirror. When Elric does so, he is puzzled by what he sees, wondering if something has indeed happened to him. Scene becomes aware that something significant must have occurred during the time Elric spent in the nest, so he asks him to share what happened. Elric, however, apologizes and explains that he cannot reveal the details just yet, but promises to tell Scene first when the time is right. Scene understands that Elric must have his reasons, but it still bothers him that his friend is keeping secrets. As they sit back on the bed, Elric inquires about the nest's status. Scene starts peeling the egg he gave Elric earlier and informs him that his family is closely guarding the nest. Surprised, Elric assumes they must be busy excavating it, but Scene corrects him, stating that they are actually grounding it to prevent anyone from entering. Elric becomes agitated, wanting to know why they are taking such measures. Scene calmly explains that it is because the nest belongs to Elric, the one who discovered it. His family is protecting it to ensure that Elric gets full credit and recognition for his significant discovery. Legally, a dragon's nest belongs to the person who discovers it, but it's common for influential institutions to gain excavation rights in such cases. Scene informs Elric that both the Magic Tower and the Academy are fiercely competing to gain control of the nest. Elric gazes at Scene while being confident that the Nemester family also desired excavation rights, but chose to block others and protect the nest for him. Scene feels uncomfortable with Elric's intense gaze and jokingly asks if Elric finds it amusing. They playfully exchange punches, and Elric thanks Scene for the compliment. However, Elric realizes that the Dean of the Academy, Barex, is likely attempting to use his influence to secure excavation rights. With a mischievous smirk, Elric contemplates the audacity of the Dean, who once tried to harm him. Concerned, Scene asks what Elric is planning, knowing that his friend tends to get into trouble with such expressions. Ignoring Scene's worry, Elric addresses him with a wide smile, causing Scene to protest and plead for Elric not to proceed. Elric then asks Scene for a favor, to spread the word that he has sustained serious injuries. Scene is incredulous upon hearing that. The Dean arrives at the Imperial Magic Hospital, but is met at the gate by Carl Donitz, the spokesperson for the Nerister family. Carl informs the Dean that Kate at Elric Malvinger is in a comatose state due to the severe injuries he sustained in the dragon's nest. He then asks the Dean to leave the premises. The Dean expresses his frustration, having come all the way to the hospital, and inquires about the excavation rites, wondering why the Narrister family is blocking access. Elric observes this interaction from his hospital room's window. After a moment of observation, Elric lets out a sigh and speaks to someone in his room. He questions why he is just staring at him without saying anything, urging him to start talking. The figure turns out to be Vessel, the Demon King. Vessel seems annoyed by Elric's lack of respect and identifies himself as the Great Demon King, Mephistopheles, who has brought danger and chaos to the world. However, Elric nonchalantly responds that he will refer to him as Fels instead. This remark infuriates Vessel, who then demands that Elric should die. Elric compares Vessel's approach to a cotton ball, implying that it might be gentler in giving massages. Standing in his hospital room, Elric places his hand on his chest, realizing that what he had sensed earlier was not just his imagination. It was indeed the Dragon Heart, the source of the ancient dragon's absolute authority. The dragon had died after being stabbed by the Demon King's lance. Elric contemplates whether the Dragon Heart entered his body when he tried to pull the lance out of the dragon's head. However, he senses something different within himself. He can only recall the events up to the point where the Demon King attempted to take over his body. Elric breaks the silence and asks Phils to stop just staring at him and speak up. He acknowledges Phils as the great Demon King who brought danger and distress to the world but still addresses him by that name. This annoys Mephistopheles, who reminds Elric not to call him by that title. In the ancient era when avatars ruled the world, the demon avatar representing darkness had four servants named Finny, the End, Insanire, Insanity, Fornications, Fornication, and Est Originalis Peccatum, Original Sin. Among them was the highest and mightiest demon king in legends, Mephistopheles, who is now attached to Elric. Fails becomes furious and insists that his name was bestowed upon him by the great demon avatar. However, 
Elric seems unimpressed and yawns, further infuriating Fels, who vows to tear Elric apart. Elric finds Fels annoying and questions whether demon kings are usually so stupid. Fels reveals that he had waited for a thousand years, intending to use his power to conquer the entire world. However, the dragon king Shinake stood in his way, declaring that they would both be buried together. Despite his long wait, Fels was ultimately foiled by Elric, who passed all his tests, but prevented Fels from taking over his body and soul. Now, Fels is left with only a fragment of demonic energy. Elric interrupts Fela's bragging and asks him to stop acting so high and prestigious. Elric lies on his bed, seemingly unconcerned, playing with his pendant. Elric's mind is filled with wonder as he contemplates whether the voice he heard could have belonged to his grandfather. As he recalls the arrangement where the first demon was to be swallowed, he speculates if this act has granted him the demon's power. The magic pendant, a tool for devouring the demon king, leads him to ponder if it's possible to devour other demons like Mephisto. Elric realizes that there might be a second and third demon. A sleek grin crosses his face, realizing what an extraordinary opportunity this is. So, Mephisto, feeling uneasy, is taken on a hike by Elric, who dismisses Mephisto's questions by calling him a noisy ghost that should keep quiet. Before Elric can fully comprehend the magic pendant's workings, he feels the need to confirm something. He settles himself down and enters a meditative state. As he closes his eyes, vivid imagery unfolds before him. A bug approaching a flower, the petals scattering in the wind. Elric experiences the sensations of the ladybug's wings flapping, the gentle breeze against his skin, and the sweet fragrance of the flowers in the air. He marvels at this newfound ability to perceive and feel everything around him. Filled with wonder, Elric contemplates whether his suspicions are correct. He extends his hand and attempts to activate the magic with the word Ignite. To his amazement, the magic responds to his call, leaving Mephisto astonished at the possibility of dragon magic being wielded by a mere human. This is truly unprecedented, even for a Malvinger. Elric can't contain his joy and laughter, realizing that he can now use magic as well. His blockage disease is finally cured. In that moment, a flood of memories rushes through Elric's mind. The times he was called a disgrace to the Malvinger family and the frustration of witnessing their prestigious magical lineage falter. All the harsh words and betrayals he endured from those who ignored him come to the forefront of his thoughts. Determination wells up within Elric and he vows to make them all regret underestimating him and betraying the Malvinger family. Outside the hospital, a crowd of reporters and journalists have gathered, bombarding Carl, the spokesperson for the Narrister family, with numerous questions about Malvinger's condition and the future of the Dragon Nest excavation rites. Carl assures them that a more detailed announcement will be made at the Magic Tower, and then leaves to attend to his other duties. Once inside Scene's room, Carl requests Scene not to involve him in such situations again. Despite the stress, Scene expresses gratitude for Carl's efforts. Carl, humbly, asks Scene not to mention it and reveals that he often feels overwhelmed by the incidents that occur whenever Scene is with Elric. He goes on to inform Scene that if his scam were to be exposed, both the Magic Tower and the Imperial family would take a severe stance against it. Scene hands Carl a handkerchief as he notices him covered in cold sweat. Assuring Carl, Scene shares that Elric claims to have everything under control, so they have to trust him. Meanwhile, in his room, Elric sits on his bed, contemplating the idea that the higher the risks, the greater the rewards. On the other hand, Scene reflects on the immense suffering he has been enduring, wondering if even Elric fully comprehends the extent of his struggles. Carl, still wiping his face with the handkerchief, inquires about Elric's whereabouts. Scene admits that he has no knowledge of Elric's destination, having only found a note from him. In the note, Elric tells Scene that he is going somewhere, but he can rely on his friend to cover for him until he returns. Scene wonders where Elric could have ventured with his frail body. Carl's attention is drawn to a letter with a seal on it, and he expresses concern, sensing that something might be amiss. Suddenly, Scene's room door is kicked open, and a familiar voice calls him her little brother. It's none other than Tasha Narrister, Scene's sister, and a Firebird witch. She playfully questions Scene, asking if he's planning something exciting without her. Scene, somewhat surprised by her sudden appearance, asks why she's here. Tasha responds, teasingly, wondering why he's so astonished. She playfully adds that it's not unusual for an older sister to visit her little brother. 
The three factions, the Magic Tower, the Imperial Family, and the Protestant Alliance have each produced exceptional geniuses in the same generation, known as the Three Stars. These prodigies are destined to lead the Empire and have been referred to as the Three New Stars. Tasha, Elric's sister and the youngest person ever to achieve the title of Megas, a great magician, is one of those three stars. Tasha playfully pulls Carl's ears and questions him if he didn't deliver her letter to Scene. Carl admits that he has been forgetful lately due to recent events. Scene, curious about her true reason for visiting, asks Tasha what brought her there. Tasha explains that she heard about Scene's friend being sick, and as someone with magical abilities, she couldn't just remain idle. She then inquires about Elric's whereabouts, not finding him in his room. Scene realizes that he might be in significant trouble if Tasha goes to the ward. Recognizing Tasha's sharp perception, Scene quickly determines that he must dismiss her before she discovers the truth. He informs Tasha that Elric is currently unable to receive visitors, advising her not to disturb the doctors and urging her to leave. Tasha catches on to Scene's attempt to divert her attention, so she firmly holds her brother's arm and applies pressure, playfully asking if he is trying to give her an order. However, it reminds Scene that Tasha is indeed a dragon fanatic, deeply interested in dragon-related matters. When she asks about the nest excavation rites, Scene realizes he had forgotten about her obsession. Feeling the force of Tasha's grip, Scene admits that the rites are something for Elric to decide. Acknowledging this, Tasha eventually eases her grip on his arm and departs, requesting Scene to contact her immediately once Elric wakes up. She playfully threatens to give him a beating if she's not the first one he contacts. With Tasha gone, Scene rubs his arm and realizes he needs to act quickly and take charge of the situation. Meanwhile, Carl, who has been witnessing the exchange, stands there and asks Scene if everything is now over, just like how he feels about his own life. The news of the prestigious family's hair being in a coma spread throughout the kingdom, sparking curiosity about who will obtain the next excavation rites. Elric, dunning a hoodie to conceal his identity, visits a newspaper shop and observes how Scene is efficiently managing things on his behalf. While browsing through the newspapers, Elric comes across his dean's photo and remarks on how photogenic he appears. Elric addresses the dean's photo, suggesting that he should keep smiling while he still has the chance. Ravern enters the dean's office and congratulates him, stating that he can now finally do what he always wanted to do. The dean, calmly sipping his tea, advises Ravern not to be in such a rush reminding him that the election for the position hasn't even begun yet. Rivern, however, insists that he sends the Dean's desire to protect the Academy and its students and addresses him as headmaster. Upon hearing this, a broad smile forms on the Dean's face, and he gently corrects Rivern, saying that he is not yet the headmaster. The Dean then shifts the topic and asks Rivern about Elric's condition. Rivern shares that he's heard about Elric's daily struggle to survive. The Dean, wearing a cunning smile that he quickly masks, expresses feigned sympathy, saying how unfortunate it is. Rivern, trying to be proactive, suggests hiring mercenaries to deal with the potential problem if Elric wakes up. However, the Dean's anger flares up at the suggestion, and he sternly asks Rivern to stop. Trembling with fear, Rivern quickly apologizes for the inappropriate idea. The Dean places his teacup back on the table and mentions that there will be an empty professor's seat after the election, wondering aloud who will fill it, given his limited knowledge of external affairs beyond the academy. Rivern understands the implication and assures the Dean that he will not disappoint him, hinting at his ambition to secure that professorial position. Under the veil of night, Elric stands outside a building, clad in his hoodie, contemplating his next move. He questions whether he should embark on this path. With his mind's eye, capable of glimpsing the unseen aspects of the world, he envisions the hidden space where he can infuse the mana from the dragon heart, enabling him to wield magic without the need for intricate incantations. Finally, Elric takes the first step, feeling like he is now standing at the starting line of a momentous journey. Gazing up at the radiant full moon, he resolves that in order to dismantle the barracks and announce the resurgence of the Malvinger family, he must grow stronger before the headmaster election. Elric's ability to use magic without complex incantations marks a significant milestone for him. However, Phils, not impressed, finds it pathetic and mocks Elric, questioning if that is the extent of his magic, even with Phils's power. Phils sarcastically refers to it as a mere jump 
and asks if Elric is merely performing tricks. Elric takes a moment to reflect by closing his eyes, realizing that Fels is right. He needs to push himself to become faster and stronger. This realization seems to irritate Fels, who questions Elric's audacity to close his eyes while they are talking. Fels proudly boasts about his past when humans, demons, and dragons trembled in his presence whenever he spoke. However, Elric's mind is preoccupied with something else, the concept of soul speech and the dragon's dragon tongue magic. Elric confidently moves his hand in a precise direction, activating his magic with a specific incantation. He focuses on constructing an image in his mind and converting it into words to trigger the magic. With a determined scream of elevate, an explosive burst of power propels him upward, soaring towards the clouds. The sight astounds Fels, who can't believe what he is witnessing. As Elric continues to ascend, he realizes that he's gone too high, but he is awestruck by the simplicity and sheer power of his newfound abilities. Excited to try it again, he prepares for another attempt. Fels, following closely behind him, is amazed at how a mere child who just learned magic can already wield soul speech and double spell, two advanced and formidable techniques. Fels notes that among the monstrous Malvinger bastards, no one possessed such extraordinary talent except for their progenitor. However, he quickly dismisses the thought, feeling as if he ventured into forbidden territory with such reflections. As Elric continues to explore the power of soul speech, Fels becomes increasingly determined to prevent him from growing any further. He contemplates the possibility of taking over Elric's body to crush his potential, but he wonders if such a thing is even possible. Elric, on the other hand, finds soul speech fascinating but challenging to grasp fully. He knows that to become stronger, he must delve into dragon's magic, but finding a suitable teacher is proving difficult. The academy is already dominated by the barracks, and there is no one skilled enough to instruct him while keeping his secret safe. Finally, Helric lands in a wooded area, where he resolves that his ideal teacher must be at least on the level of a Castellan rank of the Hexagram, a high level of magical proficiency. However, he realizes that such individuals would never accept him as their disciple due to his Malvinger heritage and the negative reputation associated with him. Elric yearns for the presence of his grandfather, father, or uncle, wishing they were still alive to guide him. Mephistopheles follows Elric and catches up to him, humorously remarking that he has no feet to trample on the sprout as Elric. Unbothered, Elric looks at Mephisto and asks if he would be willing to teach him magic. He realizes that Mephisto might be the perfect person to become his mentor. Mephisto is taken aback by Elric's unexpected request and dismisses it questioning what nonsense Elric is talking about. However, Elric persists, confidently proposing that in return for teaching him magic, he will create a new vessel for Mephisto using alchemy. Mephisto remains unimpressed, doubting that a mere human could ever create a vessel capable of containing him. However, Elric counters, expressing his determination to grow stronger and become capable of creating such a vessel. He challenges Mephisto pointing out that the demon has nothing to gain from refusing the offer, especially if Elric becomes too powerful for Mephisto to control. Elric asks Mephisto if there's any other condition he could fulfill to persuade him. Mephisto rejects the idea, questioning why he should pass on his knowledge to Elric. However, he leaves a glimmer of hope, suggesting that he might consider it if Elric becomes his kin. As Mephisto observes Elric's flustered expression, he wonders that how Elric dared to play around with him until now. He acknowledges that he is still not strong enough to devour Elric, but he formulates a devious plan. Mephisto decides to conceal some black magic within the teachings he imparts to Elric, knowing that it will gradually corrupt Elric's soul with darkness. Once Elric's soul becomes sufficiently tainted, Mephisto plans to devour him. Intrigued by the thought of Elric eventually begging to become his disciple, Mephisto envisions Elric realizing his weakness and helplessly succumbing to the idea of becoming Mephisto's vessel. However, to Mephisto's surprise, Elric simply brushes off the idea, refusing to entertain Mephisto's manipulations. This refusal makes Mephisto furious, and he shouts at Elric, claiming that there's a limit to how much he can bargain. Unfazed by Mephisto's outburst, Elric confidently tells him that if he continues playing hard to get, he won't get anything in return. He silences Mephisto by tapping his mouth shut. Further asserting his control over the situation, he casts an act-cute spell on Mephisto. Elric realizes that his soul speech magic is working better than he expected. 
Mephisto resorts to acting cute. However, Elric finds this display annoying. Mephisto acts cute under Elric's spell, but this only increases Elric's discomfort, and he wonders why he ordered Mephisto to do such a thing. Elric firmly instructs Mephisto to tread lightly, not wanting to witness any more of his antics. Elric then hands him a notebook and asks Mephisto to write down all the explanations for soul speech magic if he changes his mind. Elric assures him that he will release the notebook after reviewing its contents. Mephisto scoffs at the idea, believing that enduring a thousand years of imprisonment has made him resilient enough not to submit with just a notebook. Elric begins to warm up, considering using this time to train and practice his fire magic. Days pass, and Mephisto impatiently awaits the moment when Elric will finally ask him to teach magic. However, to his surprise, Elric continues to focus on practicing fire magic diligently day after day, without showing any interest in Mephisto's lessons. Mephisto grows frustrated as the days stretch on, but Elric remains resolute in his determination to master fire magic. Finally, Mephisto reaches a breaking point, realizing that his strategy to manipulate Elric into asking for his help has failed. He decides to submit and starts writing the basics of soul speech magic in Elric's notebook. But then Mephisto realizes his identity as the Demon King, so he resents the idea of submitting to a mere human like Elric. However, Elric uses his magic to control Mephisto, making him act like a dog under his command. Elric then reads the basics from the notebook and sarcastically asks if Mephisto is glad to cooperate with him. Elric releases Mephisto from his act cute spell and demands more detailed information in the notebook. He hints that he might let Mephisto speak if he complies. Annoyed but unable to resist, Mephisto starts writing again. However, Elric finds the writing insufficient and insists that Mephisto needs to write more than the previous day. Frustrated and unable to speak, Mephisto wonders who made such decisions. Elric proposes a deal, suggesting that if Mephisto writes something multiple times a day, he will release the mute spell for three days. He questions if Mephisto is willing to agree. Elric also critiques Mephisto's handwriting and asks him to write more clearly. Suddenly, Elric changes his mind and asks Mephisto to write everything all at once. He then questions if Mephisto is considered teaching him any of his secret techniques. This many requests infuriate Mephisto, who secretly plans to take advantage of the hidden black magic in the text to wreak havoc on Elric's body and soul. Elric realizes that his newfound power is far beyond what he had expected. Even though what he learned from Mephisto was just an introduction, the immense power he now possesses seems inexplicable. Observing Mephisto's puzzled expression, Elric notices that the Demon King seems to expect some change within Elric's body due to the use of black magic. Elric playfully questions Mephisto, asking what's wrong and suggests that Mephisto might be confused because nothing has changed as he expected. Elric reveals that he wasn't foolish enough to blindly accept and use the knowledge Mephisto provided without examining it thoroughly. He thanks Mephisto with a smile, acknowledging that he has indeed reached a new level of power, but he already knew everything that was offered to him. Mephisto's frustration reaches its peak, boiling with anger as he realizes that Elric was already aware of the black magic he tried to use on Elric. Elric ponders his next course of action. Mephisto points out that apart from his true speech, the highest-ranked soul speech, excluding the divine rank speech of an avatar, there is nothing else he can teach Elric. He warns Elric that attempting to understand true speech at his current level could drive him insane. Acknowledging Mephisto's honesty, Elric contemplates what he should do next. Mephisto suggests that magic can only be truly perfected on the battlefield, a principle that the Maldinger family has upheld throughout history while protecting the continent from demons. Elric realizes that magic can only be perfected on the battlefield is the guiding principle of the Maldinger family, who have long been at the forefront of the fight against demons. He understands that to truly master magic and become stronger, he needs to gain real combat experiences. In the territory that was devastated by the war with the demons, Elric's father taught both him and his sister. However, during that time, he suffered from the after-effects of the war and longed for the days when he was a magician fighting alongside Elric's grandfather on the battlefield. Elric would playfully inquire when he would go to the battlefield and display cool magic like his grandfather. These questions would sadden Elric's father, and in response, their mother would intervene. 
she would remind Elric that becoming a strong magician requires more than just having incredibly powerful magic like his father's. She would explain that Elric's grandfather was not only the strongest magician in the continent, but also the greatest scholar before that. However, Elric's father, as the family head, would interject, expressing his disapproval of his wife, bringing up such matters in front of the children and suggesting that she was putting on airs. Elric's father leans in and whispers in Elric's ear that despite the importance of studying, magic truly flourishes on the battlefield. Elric's mother then takes him away in his wheelchair, leaving instructions for Elric to read a brief study on the relationship between the geometrical ancient system and the new era language system by the end of the day. She entrusts Hayes, Elric's older sister, with taking care of him before departing. Hayes drags Elric away, but he resists, still wanting to spend time with his father. Elric's father tries to protest, suggesting that kids should be allowed to act like kids, but his wife interrupts him, blaming his indulgence for Elric's behavior. As the days pass, both Elric's father's and mother's illnesses worsen, and they spend more time confined to their beds. One night, Elric and Hayes sit beside their parents' beds, sobbing as they see their condition deteriorating. They came to the realization that their father's illness had worsened, and as their mother took care of them, she suddenly collapsed as well. Their father, aware of his limited time, shared the remaining vitality he had with his wife, and they both passed away together. Before their final moments, they expressed gratitude for the beautiful moments they had shared with each other. Their mother, in her last moments, turned to Hayes and entrusted her with the responsibility of taking care of her younger brother, Elric. Their father, feeling remorseful, apologized to Elric, believing that he might have been at fault for Elric's blockage disease. Amidst tears, Elric expressed his fear and asked how they could leave him behind like this. In response, his father gently held Elric's face and reflected on his entire life. He admitted that, despite his past as a magician on the battlefield, he found much greater happiness during the days he spent with Elric as a parent. His father reassured Elric that he doesn't have to become a magician and expressed his hope for Elric to live a happy life surrounded by caring people. With those heartfelt words, he passed away while holding his wife's hand. In the present, standing in the woods with Mephisto, Elric recollects these memories and contemplates the message his father left him with. While his father had suggested he didn't need to become a magician, Elric believes that his father's perception was mistaken. Elric is aware of the harsh reality that those who are not strong often get disregarded and overlooked. Determined to change his fate, he seeks to become stronger so that nobody can ignore him. Knowing that magic can only be perfected on the battlefield, Elric realizes that he needs battle experience to grow as a magician. Considering his options, he contemplates going to the Crimson Ghost Forest, which is known for its ghost-like monsters. However, he decides against it, as the dangers there might be too great. Next, he considers the Goblin Cave, but dismisses the idea due to the high number of people who might already be there. Recalling his father's advice about safe houses scattered throughout the continent, places where their ancestors used to live, Elric realizes that it might be the perfect opportunity for him to gain valuable battle experience. He tells Mephisto that they are going to visit the habitat of Yetis, known as the Yeti Highlands. In a secluded spot between the woods, Elric takes a bath in a lake. While doing so, he becomes aware of the potential risk of his true identity being exposed. To avoid any complications, he decides to change his appearance. First, he activates the dampen spell to dampen his hair, then uses the cut spell to give himself a new haircut. Next, he casts the change spell to alter his hair color and darken his skin, effectively concealing his original features and making it difficult for anyone to recognize him. Later, Elric finds himself at the guide agency, where an attendant informs him that a group is about to depart for their destination, and he is fortunate to join them. The attendant expresses surprise that not many people venture to the Yeti Highlands nowadays, making the sudden influx of travelers to the area unusual and unexpected. Elric observes the group that the attendant pointed out, relieved that they have arrived just in time for him to join them. A child from the group notices Elric and becomes excited at the sight of a new arrival. The child introduces himself as Mingma, explaining that his tribe follows a tradition of naming people based on the day of the week they were born, and in his case, it's Tuesday, symbolized as the second sunrise of the week. Mingma assures Elric that as long as he follows him and stays close, there will be no chance of him falling into any danger. He playfully assures Elric that he will keep him safe. 
Meanwhile, Mephisto finds the child's talkative nature bothersome and swears to himself that he would love to shut the child's mouth. However, Elric asks Mema that where can he buy a communication crystal orb here, but Elric becomes disappointed when he hears that there's no crystal orb available in Mema's village. He was hoping to use one to keep in touch with his sister, Hayes. However, Mema suggests using a pigeon or a letter instead, but before he can share a funny story about pigeons and letters, Elric urges him to move on, not wanting to waste time. Feeling a bit concerned about his inability to reach his sister, Elric remembers that he had informed his friend Seen about his plans, and he trusts Seen to handle things in his absence. With this reassurance, Elric decides to focus on the journey to the Yeti Highlands. Throughout their journey, Mema continues to chatter, sharing stories and experiences along the way. As Elric and Mephisto finally arrive at the Yeti Highlands, a glacier-covered area, Mephisto recognizes it as the habitat of the Yetis. Elric is curious and asks Mephisto if he knows about the Yetis and if he has been here before. Mephisto replies that he has encountered the Yetis before but makes it clear that he is not associated with them. He refers to them as dregs who dared to admire him. Elric is surprised to learn that the Yetis have some connection to demons. Mephisto clarifies that while the Yetis might have received some grace from the demon avatar in the past, he wants to be distinguished from them. Elric always considered Yetis as monsters, and the revelation that they had ties to demons is unexpected for him. Mephisto mentions that the Yetis had a ruler in the past, whose grave might still be present in the region. However, he adds that he has no knowledge of its exact location, and if it still exists, it's likely been robbed by now. Elric's mind races with thoughts and possibilities as he stands in the Yeti Highlands, knowing that if the Yetis are somehow connected to demons, there might be a link to his family's safe houses and their legacies. He vividly remembers the advice his father gave him before he passed away, instructing him to visit the Yeti Highlands when he becomes an adult and family head to confirm the family's legacy and pay respects to their ancestor. Holding his pendant, Elric wonders if the answers to his questions about the magic pendant lie within the family safe house. He contemplates how the safe houses were built to protect the family's secrets and wonders if visiting one will help him understand more about his pendant and his family's magical heritage. However, Mema continues with his stories about the first Yeti to ever exist. According to the tale, this Yeti was abandoned by her husband and left in the highlands, and eventually, the woman died. Seeking revenge, she encountered a Yuki Ana who suddenly appeared, and that's how the story began. As he keeps walking away, his voice gradually gets lower and lower, but Mephisto's patience wears thin. He asks Elric if he can use mute magic to silence the child, as his ears are about to bleed. Elric humorously dismisses the idea, asking what kind of ghost could possibly bleed. Elric ponders why the Yetis, who Mephisto had spoken so much about, haven't shown up yet. Mema enthusiastically informs everyone that the upcoming path will become much more complicated, suggesting they have some food before continuing. They all gather around a fire to rest. Among them, Elric notices a man who asks to borrow a little fire from them and appears to be almost as strong as a noble's knight. Curiously, Elric wonders if they have a secret mission since they don't seem to be targeting him. His attention then turns to a figure sitting among them, wearing a hooded blue gown. Elric speculates if this might be their leader, but the person doesn't appear particularly strong. To his surprise, the individual removes the hood, revealing long blue hair, and Elric realizes it's a woman. One of the men whistles upon seeing her, and another compliments her beauty, marveling at the unexpected golden experience for his eyes in such a place. Shen draws out his sword and places it against the man's neck, declaring that he must pay for his sin of speaking disrespectfully to the young miss with his life. However, the young lady intervenes and requests Chen to lower his sword. Elric is astonished that the man dared to flirt with a noble lady and wonders if he's in his right mind. Chen is still clearly upset, but he complies and sheathes his sword upon her request. Suddenly, another man comes rushing towards them and urgently advises them to run. As they stand there, a man approaches them and urgently warns that they should run. A fight breaks out among them, and Chen immediately orders his men to protect the young lady. Elric is reminded of his own situation in Nest, and he observes that arrows are raining down on them from multiple directions. He activates his block magic, conjuring a protective shield above himself. However, he realizes that the others are still being bombarded and are desperately calling for help. 
Mephisto identifies their attackers as the Moronic Crimson Eyes tribe. Elric is surprised to see so many of them, as Yidus are usually found in packs of ten. Chen commands his men to eliminate the attackers, and Mephisto playfully teases Elric about feeling scared at the time of battle, calling it typical of a human. But Elric isn't in the mood for banter and silences Mephisto with his magic, reminding him that now is not the time for chatting. Elric is fascinated by the Yetis' use of aura, which reminds him of how knights utilize it. However, he knows that this is not the time to study their abilities further. The Yetis that launched the surprise attack are only part of the problem. There is another pack lying in wait for a chance to ambush them. Making the wrong move could lead them all into danger, but Elric realizes that the situation changes if they take the initiative. Drawing on his knowledge of memorized magic, Elric activates transformation removal to transform back to his original shape and armament spells, which he had recorded as strengthening magic. Though unsure if his attacks will be effective against the Yetis, he launches his assault to slow them down. Elric unleashes his magic burst creating a powerful explosion that deters some of the approaching Yetis. As a few of them attempt to close in on him again, he uses Burst once more, causing another explosion to keep them at bay. Elric then employs his Penetrate Magic to deal with the remaining Yetis efficiently. With only two Yetis left standing, Elric decides to walk away. However, the they call out to him, questioning where he thinks he's going. Instead of answering, Elric looks back and uses his Bind Spell. Sitting on a big yeti lying on the ground, Elric asks the creature that isn't he really cool and suggests having a chat with the other yetis. He notices that Mephisto still can't talk and asks why he didn't tell him earlier. Elric teasingly realizes that he couldn't say anything even if he wanted to. When Elric finally lets Mephisto speak again, Mephisto tries to scold him, but Elric quickly says shut again, scaring Mephisto and making him close his mouth on his own. Elric realizes they don't have much time, so he asks Mephisto to be his translator. He wants Mephisto to tell the Yetis that he will spare him if they tell him where their village is. Mephisto talks with the Yetis using their own language. Curious about Mephisto's intentions, the Yetis inquire why they should trust him. Mephisto responds with utmost seriousness, explaining that during challenging times like these, it's better to negotiate through conversation rather than resorting to threats or manipulation. Elric, sitting nearby, asks Mephisto to relay a message to the Yetis, promising to set them free if they act quickly. Mephisto leans in and whispers something into the ears of the towering Yetis. Intrigued by the private exchange, Elric uses his magical interpret spell to understand what was said. To his surprise, Elric realizes that Mephisto has conveyed a message urging the Yetis to join forces and banish this wicked man to a place of darkness together. Upon hearing this, the Yetis let out a thunderous roar, which startles Elric. Yet, with a wave of his finger, Elric calms down the majestic creatures and proposes continuing the discussion. In this moment of suspense, both Elric and Mephisto are eager to hear the Yetis response. Elric tells Mephisto that many kind-hearted Yetis are dying because of him. Elric uses his powers to control the Yetis and make Mephisto appear cute and binds Yetis as well. In response, Mephisto tells Elric that Elric is the one responsible for the Yetis' deaths. Elric places his hand on his chest, where he carries the powerful dragon heart. It contains the mana of both a dragon and a powerful demon king. However, Elric can only access a tiny fraction, about 3% of its total power. If he were to try drawing out more than that, his body wouldn't be able to handle it, risking a dangerous explosion. Despite the risks, Elric feels compelled to press forward. He knows that he can't retreat at this crucial moment if he wants to bring back his family from their dire situation. The thought of giving up with so much at stake is just not an option for him. In any case, Elric worries about that noble lady and her safety. She informs Chen, a person in her group, that someone is missing, and there are two possibilities. Either the missing person ran away and is hiding somewhere, or something bad happened to them. Chen believes the missing person probably escaped safely, and the lady hopes the same, wishing for their safety. Elric tries to prevent unnecessary fighting between the Yetis and his group. He asks the Yetis to let him meet their tribe chief. The Yetis respond with loud roars, and soon, the tribe chief appears. Elric explains that he has something important to discuss and hopes for a peaceful resolution. However, he also knows that if negotiations fail and violence is unavoidable, he may have to take quick action to defeat their boss. 
the Yeti chief notices something peculiar about Elric, his striking green eyes. Curious, the chief inquires about his name, to which Elric introduces himself as Elric Malvinger. The chief then invites Elric to follow him, leading them both to a more secluded area where they can talk privately. The chief of the Yetis informs Elric about a legend that has been passed down in their tribe. When Elric asks about the legend, the chief explains that in the distant past, a powerful king ruled over the snowy mountain. The Yetis elaborate on the legend, stating that the king considered a human with bright green eyes with the name Malvinger as his true friend. According to the legend, the Yeti tribe chiefs have faithfully kept their promise to the king, which involves taking care of the dwelling place of the humans. Curious to know where this dwelling is located, Elric inquires further. The Yetis point downwards, indicating a massive hole in the glacier as the exact location of the ancient human home. Elric questions whether there is a house below the cliff, and to his surprise, he realizes that there truly is one, an undraft. The chief explains that even for the Yetis, they can only descend to the house once a year when the dangerous undraft settles down. Mephisto whispers to Elric, expressing concern that regular magic won't be enough to keep him from freezing down there. He questions what Elric plans to do in this situation, adding that with his current abilities, it seems impossible. Elric agrees that attempting such a feat with his current skills would be reckless. However, he knows that if he returns without taking any action, he won't be able to make any progress. Feeling a strong sense of duty to honor his ancestors' desires to witness the abilities of their descendant, Elric makes a bold decision. Without hesitation, he leaps into the hole saying he must reply in kind. Despite being aware of the recklessness of his current skills, Elric faces a pivotal decision. If he retreats now, he won't make any progress. Additionally, motivated by his ancestors' desire to witness his descendants' abilities, Elric bravely steps forward and plunges into a vast, deep hole. As Mephisto calls out from behind, warning him of imminent danger, Elric experiences an unexpectedly intense force during the descent. Mephisto joins him and urges him to concentrate emphasizing the consequence of failure. In a daring move, Elric casts the spell Tread, causing a powerful explosion that cushions his landing on the ground. Though he anticipated his demise, he miraculously survives the perilous descent. Mephisto expresses to Elric that he is at a loss for words when it comes to describing Elric. Nevertheless, Elric gazes at the seemingly ordinary wooden shack before him and finds it underwhelming. Upon approaching the house, he discovers that it is secured with ancient magic, though he doesn't believe it was intended to be difficult to unlock. Mephisto suggests trying to insert a mana pattern in the form of words to open the door. Elric attempts numerous mana patterns, including Mervinger, Malvinger, a prestigious magic family, Demon King, Demon Hunter, Yeti, and many others, but none prove to be the correct sequence. This leaves Elric pondering the possibility of a key-like element. Suddenly, he recalls his pendant and uses it to unlock the door successfully, rendering the search for the correct mana pattern a waste of time. Inside the seemingly ordinary wooden shack, to Elric's amazement, he discovers a magnificent library. Filled with excitement, he delves into the collection of books, which covers a wide range of subjects, including the fundamental doctrine of magic, the magic of fairies and beast men, and even black magic. The library appears to have books on all imaginable topics. As they explore, Mephisto suggests that this must have been the dwelling place of the Winter Sage. Intrigued, Elric glances over at Mephisto and inquires about the identity of the Winter Sage. He speculates that since Mephisto is acquainted with both the Yeda King and Elric's ancestor, he might have a story to share about the Winter Sage as well. However, Elric soon becomes captivated by a particular book, momentarily forgetting his question about the Winter Sage. Elric's curiosity deepens as he comes across that book's title, The History of Mervinger. As he opens the book, his attention is immediately caught by a line that seems eerily familiar. Eradicating demons is their family's only duty, the same words he heard in his dream. Intrigued, he continues reading, and his eyes are drawn to a passage that discusses the concept of devouring demons repeatedly to create a new harmonious form of magic. The text suggests that by consuming demons, a new era of magic can be ushered in, and it addresses a descendant who has successfully passed the first test and assignment of the magic pendant and swallowed the first demon. Alric starts to feel a sense of connection to these words. Suddenly, the surroundings change dramatically, and Elric finds himself lying on a grassy ground, 
disoriented and unsure of where he is. As he sits up, a voice from behind addresses him as a descendant far into the future, destined to inherit their assignment. Elric turns to see who is speaking and asks the person, Who are you? He introduces himself as Otto Han Merbinger, the guide who directs and tests his future descendants through various assignments. Centuries ago, certain individuals developed the Merbinger family's magical system, and Otto Han is among the five esteemed ancestors in Elric's family lineage. Otto Han mentions to Elric that he appears to be familiar with him, to which Elric inquires whether by esteemed ancestors he means the Winter Sage. Otto Han is surprised that anyone knows that nickname and asks Elric where he heard it. Elric reveals that Mephisto mentioned it, but he realizes that Mephisto is no longer present with him and wonders where he went. Otto Han asks Elric if he is referring to the Demon King of Original Sin, Mephisto. Elric casually agrees and dismissively considers Mephisto as just a worthless ghost. In response, Otto Han places his hand on Elric's shoulder and points out that the first demon Elric swallowed is Mephisto, makes him an exceptional descendant. He playfully asks Elric if now he will have to increase the difficulty of the assignments. Elric inquires from Otto about the nature of the assignment and what he is being guided in. In response, Otto gently pats Elric's head and acknowledges that he must have many questions and might be wondering why the assignment is so challenging. He explains that the reason they leave behind a record of the assignment is because it resembles a wheel. Once set in motion, it becomes unstoppable. Hence, they cannot entrust this responsibility to just anyone, leading them to carefully scrutinize their descendants, regardless of how much time it takes. Otto then informs Elric that since he has successfully passed his test, the decision lies entirely with him. He can choose to stop the wheel's motion or continue its course, carrying forward the responsibilities that come with it. Otto reiterates to Elric that now that he has passed the test, the decision is entirely in his hands. He can choose whether to stop the wheel or set it in motion. Elric gazes at the magic wheel he holds in his hand, but he is uncertain about the assignment that awaits him. He realizes that stepping into it without careful consideration could erase everything he knows about his current life. Knowing this, he views this moment as his final opportunity to back out and avoid the potential consequences. Determined, he clenches his fist, causing the magic wheel to vanish. Acknowledging Elric's decision, Otto nods and says he respects it. Elric passionately declares that his dream has always been to revive his family fulfill the desires of his grandfather and ancestors, the esteemed heroes of their lineage, and leave his own mark as a great magician in the history of their land. Otto shows his approval and excitement by slapping Elric's shoulder with joy, although Elric winces in pain. Next, Otto leads Elric to a frigid and icy place. Trembling from the cold, Elric asks about their location. Otto explains that this is the testing ground where Elric will obtain his first assignment. The idea of facing a test in such an unforgiving place sends shivers down Elric's spine, but at the same time, he feels a sense of anticipation, believing that he might become even stronger through this experience. Despite his fear, a smile appears on Elric's face. Otto notices his smile and commends him, appreciating the excellent attitude he displays as a candidate. Upon Otto's instruction, Elric looks in a particular direction and begins to see more deeply. He witnesses the figure of the Ice Mountain King, the first and last ruler to unite the Yidis and govern over the Icy Mountain. Despite his accomplishments, the Ice Mountain King's ambition led him to attempt restoring the Yidis to their former status as demons after they were demoted. However, his aspirations consumed him, transforming him into a corrupted and wicked demon. Elric is taken aback by what he sees and questions whether Otto expects him to kill that being. Otto clarifies that his task is not to kill the demon, but to swallow it instead. He goes on to explain that, from this point onward, Elric's duty will be to consume demons and extract their seals, which are the core of their existence. Otto proceeds to enlighten Elric about the nature of demons. These entities are born from the primitive and dark emotions found within living beings, such as fear, depression, and resentment. These negative emotions aggregate and form an ego that harbors evil desires. It is these malevolent desires that shape a demon's personality, rank, and emblem. The core of a demon's existence is the heart that houses their evil desire, and this is referred to as a seal. Elric witnesses the imprinting of a demon king's seal on his arm, the seal of original sin, which represents Mephistopheles. Otto explains that from this point forward, 
Elric's task is to hunt demons and extract their seals, as they are the very root of their existence. When Elric swallows a demon, he gains access to all of their abilities, effectively absorbing their powers. Elric poses a question to Otto, curious about the extent of his strength, if he were to acquire the overwhelming abilities of such a formidable monster. Despite his uncertainty, he decides that he will eventually find out and unlocks a power armament. Otto reminds Elric that his objective is not to defeat demons, but to swallow them. Puzzled, Elric wonders how he is supposed to accomplish this task. Does he have to bite them? The thought seems absurd. As he observes the warriors who protect the demon king, he realizes that there are dozens of them, and their power surpasses the Yidas he faced before, particularly their leader. Elric starts questioning whether he can truly emerge victorious against these formidable opponents with his current skills and abilities. Elric gazes at the seal of original sin on his arm and wishes he could wield the Demon King's abilities to confront all his adversaries, including the Ice Mountain King. However, Elric is aware that he lacks the knowledge of how to utilize this seal effectively. The demon roars menacingly, snapping Elric back to reality. He considers that using the Demon King's power, especially in this initial test, might be considered cheating. Trying to focus, Elric casts his burst spell, unleashing a massive explosion. Yet, to his surprise, an arrow is suddenly shot towards him from an unknown source, coming dangerously close. Elric takes action, swiftly using his rays and penetrate spells to neutralize the incoming arrows. Addressing the monstrous warriors, he speaks about their past as part of the demon race, acknowledging that they were once abandoned when they became weak. Alric tells them that he understands the need to become stronger to avoid such a fate. His determination to grow stronger intensifies, knowing that with enough strength, he can overcome trials like this one. He raises his hands, ready to unleash a formidable magic, but to his surprise, the leader of the warriors swiftly attacks him with his sword. Alric is knocked back coughing from the impact. He realizes that if he continues at this rate, he will likely be defeated. However, his wound starts healing magically. With a fierce determination not to be defeated on the first trial, Elric refuses to let his body's limitations hold him back. He knows he needs more mana to continue, and in a moment of desperation, he draws upon the power of the Dragon Heart. Using his bloom and scatter magic, he tries to counter the soldiers forming around him. Feeling overwhelmed, Elric closes his eyes for a moment, questioning the reality of the situation. He finds it hard to believe that this is only the first round, as the challenge is incredibly harsh. As he prepares to cast another spell, his attention is drawn to the seal on his arm. Although it is not as prominent as the seal of original sin, Elric realizes that a new seal is formed through his experiences in this trial. Elric taps into the mana of the dragon heart. He senses that the explosive energy has somehow stabilized. Otto clarifies that the demons refer to their seals as their true names, and if Elric wishes to use their power, he must discover these true names. Elric expresses concern about how he can obtain this knowledge, knowing that the demons may not willingly reveal it. Otto assures Elric that he need not worry, as when the right time comes, he will naturally be able to feel and understand the true names. Trusting in this, Elric tries to use his magic to find out the true name of the Yetis, and to his surprise, he discovers it is cruelty. Even though he can't explain how he knows, he can feel the power of the seal and understand their true names. Elric launches an attack, invoking the power of the Yetis seal with the words, May you be cold and heartless. While the results are impressive, Elric realizes that the mana consumption is quite high. Nevertheless, he is amazed at the power of the seal he possesses. As Elric looks at the remaining warriors, he laughs confidently, realizing they are the only ones left. However, his laughter is interrupted when he suddenly starts bleeding from his mouth, leaving him puzzled and wondering about the cause of this unexpected injury. Elric finds himself back in the library, feeling somewhat disoriented by the experience he just had. Mephisto, who is present beside him, comments on the challenging ordeal that Elric went through. Mephisto mentions that he expected the assignment to activate, as Elric fell asleep while this pendant was going crazy. Mephisto playfully asks Elric if it wasn't an easy task. Elric realizes that he must have passed out due to the immense strain on his mana after relying heavily on the power of the seal. He contemplates the possibility of having died for real if he had been too reckless with his beliefs in the seal. He runs his thumb over the seal on his arm, marveling at the power of the incomplete seal of cruelty. 
This leads him to ponder just how extraordinary the power of the seal of original sin might be. Mephisto notices the seal on Elric's arm and speculates that it could indeed be the seal of cruelty, acknowledging that the Winter Sage devised an intriguing scheme. Elric calls Mephisto Mephi and inquires about how to use the seal of original sin. However, Mephisto scolds him, asking if the Winter Sage revealed Mephisto's true name to him. He refuses to divulge any information about the seal, emphasizing its significance to demons. Elric remarks that he had thought Mephisto would react this way. He understands that the seals hold immense importance to demons, and Mephisto revealing the true name to Elric would mean giving away a significant part of himself. Despite his curiosity, Elric decides to give up on obtaining the information from Mephisto for now. He knows that he will need to find other ways to uncover the knowledge he seeks about the seal of original sin. Above all, the seal of original sin is the mark of a demon king. Considering Elric's struggle with harnessing the power of the Yeti seal, it seems implausible for him to handle the might of a demon king's seal. However, a realization dawns on Elric, and he questions Mephisto about knowing the Ice Mountain King. Mephisto is taken aback by the sudden inquiry, and Elric explains that they are in the Ice Mountain King's grave, and he needs to capture him. Mephisto becomes furious, expressing his disbelief that Ottohan would dare assign someone like Elric to catch the entity he himself acknowledged. Elric persists and implores Mephisto to share any helpful methods. However, Mephisto bluntly states that he knows none. Undeterred, Elric tries to persuade Mephisto by emphasizing that the Ice Mountain King is no longer a part of the demon race, and he can at least reveal that much. This infuriates Mephisto, who begins to scold Elric. But Elric cleverly offers Mephisto a tempting proposition, a three-day exemption from Agio Hell a state of acting cute, in exchange for the information. Mephisto remains unimpressed, but Elric raises two more fingers, offering a five-day exemption. Frustrated, Mephisto grinds his teeth in anger, but Elric seems to back off and suggest forgetting about it. However, Mephisto quickly changes his tune, stating that his generosity is as vast as the ocean, and he will let it go just this once. Elric teases him for being willing to share the information for a mere five-day exemption. Mephisto advises Elric to listen carefully, stating that with the current seal he possesses, clearing the assignment seems impossible. According to Mephisto, Elric won't even come close to the Ice Mountain King. However, he assures Elric that there is still some hope. The scene shifts and Elric finds himself back in the test ground. He realizes how bitterly cold it is there, exactly the reason he didn't want to return. Elric knows he must use the hint Mephisto gave him, which was to raise his achievement. Mephisto explained that seals can be categorized into different ranks, common, advanced, precious, unique, and mythic, based on their rarity. Additionally, there is something called an achievement level, which determines various levels of power even within the same rank. Elric's seal of cruelty is classified as precious, which is undoubtedly not a low rank. However, his achievement level is only one star, while the seal of the Ice Mountain King is at an impressive 10-star level. To have a chance against the Ice Mountain King, Alric realizes that he must either elevate his achievement level to 10 stars or promote his rank to unique. Alric finally gets to meet the Ice Mountain King and realizes that defeating countless warriors didn't raise his achievement level past 2 stars. He understands that he must face the Ice Mountain King directly to increase his achievement. However, he soon realizes that what he initially perceived as the shadow of the Ice Mountain King is, in fact, pure demonic energy. This revelation makes him wonder about the true nature of the Ice Mountain King when he was alive, to have attained such power. Elric reflects on his encounters with Otto and questions whether Otto is genuinely an esteemed ancestor of his family, or perhaps his archenemy. Despite the uncertainty, Elric decides to give it his best shot. He knows the challenge will be difficult, but he believes that he can overcome it. After collecting all the seals and facing the challenges, Elric wakes up back in the library, feeling frustrated that he died without being able to make any progress. Mephisto tries to persuade him to give up on the assignment, but Elric appears to be dismissive of his words. Instead, Elric is filled with excitement as he realizes that even though the Ice Mountain King is a formidable entity, he can still extract her seal if he defeats her. He then surprises Mephisto by asking if the Ice Mountain King is, in fact, a woman. Mephisto scolds him for looking at him strangely, 
making Elric sense that there might be some history between Mephisto and the Ice Mountain King. Determined to unravel this mystery, Elric decides to take his time in understanding their connection. Elric holds his pendant and contemplates that swallowing the Ice Mountain King's seal remains a priority for him, even if he's uncertain about how to achieve it, but he guesses he will find out if he beats the shit out of her. The relationship between the Ice Mountain King and Mephisto seems to be quite unique. However, Elric's primary focus right now is on obtaining and consuming the Ice Mountain King's seal. Despite not knowing exactly how to do it, Elric is confident that he will figure it out as long as he can defeat her in battle. Elric takes a deep dive somewhere facing the discomfort it brings. He perseveres, slowly but steadily approaching his goal. Gradually, he begins to comprehend how to utilize the Ice Mountain King's Seal of Cruelty. However, he realizes that it's no easy feat for him, as someone who has recently acquired the seal, to surpass the Ice Mountain King, who has mastered it. Nevertheless, Elric is unwavering in his determination to surpass her. He is willing to adopt her habits, actions, ways, and theories, even if he has to steal everything from her. In the underground chamber, Elric finds the statue of the Ice Mountain King. In an enthusiastic display of camaraderie, he initiates a high five with the statue, maintaining the gesture for a few moments. However, an unexpected explosion sends Elric flying backward. From a distance, Otto observes Elric's repeated deaths, wondering if his spirit will eventually crumble under such circumstances. Despite the setbacks, Otto notices that Elric is smiling and is remaining undeterred, displaying innate talent, an unyielding will, and an insatiable desire to improve. Impressed, Otto realizes that such a remarkable individual is rare, even within his own family. Suddenly, an arm from Alunatio, a creature of power, floats towards Elric. As he grabs it, Elric's achievement level reaches three stars. The Ice Mountain King launches a swift magical attack, leaving Elric with little time to react. He activates his protective shield, but to his surprise, the Ice Mountain King's magic penetrates through it. Faced with the limitations of merely stealing power, Elric understands that he must do more to defeat the Ice Mountain King. To succeed, he needs to comprehend her, and, in a profound realization, Elric knows he must become her. In the midst of darkness, Elric finds himself wondering if he has died once again. Mephisto emerges from the shadows and challenges Elric to prove himself. He requests that Elric demonstrate his worthiness to be a part of their race and bows before him, addressing him as the Ice Mountain King. With eyes closed, Elric contemplates whether he has truly become the Ice Mountain King. When he opens his eyes, he witnesses the Ice Mountain King's past. He sees her receiving an oracle from the demon Avatar, foretelling her destiny as the leader of the Highlands, destined to rule over the mountain range. While she was born as the king to unite the tribes and reign over the Ice Mountain, she couldn't be content with just that. The vision reveals the ambitions and desires that led the Ice Mountain King to seek more than her original destiny. Her resolve to reclaim her tribe's former glory was unwavering. Once part of the demon race, she was determined to restore them to their rightful place. Beyond the Ice Mountain's borders, she led countless humans and demons to kneel before her, finally reuniting her tribe with the demon race. But she aspired for more. She desired to become a demon king herself. However, her ambitions collided with the seemingly insurmountable barrier of demon king Mephistophilus' power. Defeat was bitter, yet she persisted, tirelessly refining her true name and evolving her seal. She yearned to step just a little further, inching closer to Mephistophilus' acknowledgement. Alas, she encountered an unprecedented wall, more formidable than any she had faced before. She was on the verge of receiving Mephistophilus' acknowledgement, just a little further, and it would have been hers. However, her ascent was abruptly halted by an imposing wall, the most formidable obstacle she had ever encountered. As she struggled, she cried out for someone to come to her aid, desperately seeking help. Amidst the chaos, Otto Han Merbinger appears. She reassures everyone that they are part of the powerful demon race, capable of achieving anything they set their minds to. Encouraging them to instill terror in the enemies blocking their paths, she calls upon her fellow demons to rise and show their strength. However, despite her determination, she lost the war against the humans, led by Otto Han Merbinger, eventually being forced to retreat to the Ice Mountain. In her anguish, she questions why the humans, who already possessed everything they could desire, refused to allow her to have any share of it. 
Tears flow as she grapples with the pain of her defeat. Despite her moments of despair, the Ice Mountain King remains steadfast in her duty, enduring numerous hardships to restore her race's former glory, a weighty responsibility. Following that pivotal day, Adohan settled in the Ice Mountain to keep a watchful eye on her. Through countless battles, the two adversaries gradually developed mutual respect and spent a considerable amount of time together. However, the Ice Mountain King could never completely shake off the allure of her ambitions and eventually succumb to becoming a monster. Her fate was sealed by Otto Han's hand, leading to her demise. Now, in the present, she addresses Elric, recognizing him as the descendant from a distant future. Helric is taken aback, realizing that what the Ice Mountain King is saying aligns with Otto's words. She acknowledges Elric's prowess, noting that he managed to diminish a portion of her mana and even cut her arm. Quickly apologizing for the harm caused, Elric listens as she explains that despite her downfall due to her unyielding ambition, she was once a formidable ruler and warrior, leading her race with authority. But she asserts that she doesn't seek pity from an adversary like Elric. The Ice Mountain King reflects on the length of the battle and realizes that the time has come for her to offer apologies to her people and honor their sacrifices. She questions the greed that once compelled her to seek acceptance among the demon race, realizing that finding happiness with the ones she loves would have been enough. Elric observes the encroachment of demonic energy on the Ice Mountain King, feeling uncertain about what to do next. However, he reminds himself that he is facing the formidable Ice Mountain King, the one who united this vast Ice Mountain and remains the greatest warrior of the Yidis, a foe he must overcome. Elric understands that defeating her without using his full strength would be both impossible and disrespectful to her. Instead, he makes a determined declaration to show her the great duty she has built through her life's efforts. The Ice Mountain King acknowledges Elric as the descendant from a distant future, and he realizes that Ottohan also made a similar claim. She notes how Elric managed to diminish a portion of her mana and cut off her arm, acknowledging that Otto's boasting was not unfounded. Elric offers a sincere apology for causing harm to her. Despite her struggles and unyielding ambition, she proudly proclaims herself as both a king and a warrior who once led her people. She asserts that she does not seek pity from an enemy like Elric, asserting her strength and identity. She recognizes that the time has come to end the prolonged battle, so she can apologize to her people and honor their sacrifices. Reflecting on her past ambitions, the Ice Mountain King questions why she was ever greedy to be a part of the demon race. She realizes that finding happiness with the one she loves would have been sufficient, and her pursuits led her astray. As the Ice Mountain King becomes enveloped in demonic energy, Elric finds himself uncertain about what he should do. However, he admonishes himself to gather his resolve, recognizing that his adversary is none other than the Ice Mountain King, the ruler who united this immense Ice Mountain and the most formidable warrior among the Yetis. She is the enemy he must overcome, and defeating her without using his full strength would not only be impossible but disrespectful. With unwavering determination, Alric decides to demonstrate the great duty that the Ice Mountain King has worked so hard to build. He attempts once more to understand and embody her essence. Despite the high stakes of this life-threatening battle, Alric surprisingly finds himself enjoying the challenge. As he faces her, he senses the days filled with happiness that the Ice Mountain King once spent with Otto. After a grueling battle, both Elric and the Ice Mountain King have pushed themselves to their limits. The decisive moment arrives as they prepare for the final strike. With the Ice Mountain King unleashing her formidable secret art, Icebreaker, a technique that has brought countless races to their knees. The impact of this last clash is immense. Suddenly, with a resounding explosion, the Ice Mountain King comes back to life and bursts into laughter. She expresses gratitude to Elric before vanishing into the ground, leaving behind a blossoming plant. Elric bids her farewell, offering his well wishes for her to rest in peace. With this final exchange, Elric's first assignment is finally concluded. Otto Han applauds Elric, impressed that he managed to successfully swallow the Ice Mountain King. Elric expresses his astonishment at the difficulty of the first assignment from the very beginning. Otto explains that challenges are commonplace in their family, and one cannot rightfully claim to be a Melbinger if they cannot overcome such trials. However, Otto admits to being pleasantly surprised by Elric's progress. Despite acknowledging Elric's talent, 
Otto had expected the task to take him around one to three years to complete. To Otto's amazement, Elric, who has only been studying magic for a few years, managed to defeat the Ice Mountain King in just a month. Elric realizes that it has indeed been one month since he began learning magic, and after considering the time spent in this realm, he concludes that it has now been a total of two months. Otto chuckles at the mix-up, playfully commenting that it's quite the whimsical Melbinger joke. He then gently grabs Elric, expressing how keen his intuition is when it comes to judging people's abilities. Otto wraps Elric in a tight hug, but Elric protests that it hurts and finds Otto's beard somewhat bothersome. Nevertheless, Otto maintains the firm embrace. He then inquires about the Ice Mountain King's final moments, and Elric replies that she was smiling. This seems to bring relief to Otto. Elric respectfully bows and expresses his gratitude to Otto for everything he has done so far. Otto advises him to take care on his way back. Elric mentions that he won't be able to visit often due to the responsibilities of being the head of a family. As Elric begins to walk away, he returns and asks Otto how to leave this place. Otto points out that Elric has already exited countless times before. Confused, Elric doesn't recall the way. At that moment, Otto employs his magic, and Elric awakens back in the library. Mephisto playfully taunts Elric, jokingly suggesting that Otto killed him. Elric retorts, asking who in their right mind would kill someone without warning. Mephisto inquires if Elric has successfully swallowed the Ice Mountain King, and Elric confirms that it just happened, pointing at the seal on his arm. Mephisto takes credit for his support in the matter, which prompts Elric to mockingly remark that Mephisto certainly turned the situation around. Mephisto denies this claim and explains that he merely provided Elric with some guidance, recognizing him as a true prodigy and even a monster in terms of power. Elric then brings up a curious matter questioning Mephisto about his special relationship with the Ice Mountain King and why he prevented her from becoming a demon. Mephisto appears surprised that Elric is aware of this and realizes that Elric must have glimpsed into the Ice Mountain King's memories. Elric seeks an explanation from Mephisto about his actions, and Mephisto candidly states that he is a demon king, and the Ice Mountain King was nothing more than a remnant of the demon race, holding no special significance to him. At that time, Mephisto was feeling rather bored, so he decided to check out someone who claimed they would become a demon in the Ice Mountain. He found that the individual was a bit lacking to become a demon king, but her ambition and skills were commendable. Mephisto realized that if she had encountered someone like Azazel or Lilith, instead of a benevolent king like him, she might have been obliterated. Regardless, he advised her to come find him again, once she had become stronger and then left her. Elric questions if that was the end of their interactions, and if Mephisto never met her again. Mephisto scoffs at the idea, asking why on earth he would meet her again. Elric understands that this is the way brats bully the girls they have a one-sided affection for. Mephisto becomes infuriated by Elric's comment. Elric continues his banter, remarking that it's no wonder Mephisto is still single, even after over a thousand years. Mephisto takes offense at Elric's teasing. Meanwhile, Otto standing back where Elric left him, finds Elric to be an amusing descendant and asks the Ice Mountain King if she shares the same sentiment. He wonders if she harbors any resentment towards Elric. Deep within the ground, the Ice Mountain King looks toward Otto and requests him to end her life. With a heavy heart, Otto apologizes and expresses gratitude to her. He encourages her to leave behind any regrets and duties, entrusting them to Elric and to rest in peace. Tears well up in Otto's eyes as he expresses his hope to meet her again in the next life, wishing for it to be even more beautiful than before. Mephisto inquires about Elric's purpose as he sees him rummaging through the books. Elric explains that he is searching for something specific. Intrigued, Mephisto asks what it is that compels him to come through the entire library. Elric proudly displays an egg-shaped crystal and reveals that it is an ice crystal given to him by Otto. He shares that Otto instructed him to find the avatar of Camella using the crystal. Curious, Mephisto asks if Camella refers to the Camella flower, to which Elric confirms it as Otto's directive to find his new guide. Elric inquired if this too is an assignment, and Otto's reply was affirmative. Elric wondered how long he will have to continue with these assignments, and Otto told him it will be until he reaches the level of his progenitor. Acknowledging that Elric must have many questions, 
Otto reassured him that all will be revealed in due time. Otto explained that the progenitor has accomplished and left numerous things in this land, and they have prepared several assignments for Elric to follow in his footsteps. All Elric needs to do is diligently walk that path. Elric responded with a confident, okay, and Otto apologized for burdening him with such a heavy responsibility. However, he reassured Elric that this path is one that only Elric Melbinger, the head of Melbinger, can walk. He encouraged him to embrace it and perfect the winter. In the library, Elric observes the crystal and remarks that he was told to take it to the avatar of Camilla. Mephisto bursts into laughter and questions the idea of an avatar of Camilla, speculating that Elric is trying to create winter. Elric then asks Mephisto if he knows what winter truly meant. Mephisto responds with a reference to the abominable four seasons that haunted demon kings like himself. Elric requests more details, but Mephisto retorts, questioning why he should comply with that request. Elric offers Mephisto a four-day Agio exemption. Mephisto questions how long Elric thinks that exemption will work. Elric goes on to propose even a mute exemption, but he firmly states that he won't offer more than that. Reluctantly, Mephisto agrees and begins to explain. He tells Elric about the four retainers who assisted Elric's progenitor in establishing the foundation of Mervinger spring, summer, autumn, and winter. These retainers, known as the Four Seasons, were named by demons based on their personalities and characteristics. Among them, Otto Han was associated with winter. Mephisto highlights that the fact that someone like Otto Han remains as a guide to the assignments suggests that he is trying to pass down the power he once had to Elric. The realization strikes Elric that if he completes this assignment, he might receive assignments from the other three seasons as well. Obtaining the power of the Four Seasons would enable him to become as strong as the progenitor they served. If Elric continues to absorb seals as powerful as the Seal of Cruelty or even stronger ones, it won't be impossible to rebuild the family. Curious, Elric asks Mephisto why the Avatar of Camilla would need the Ice Crystal. Mephisto explains that the Ice Crystal is the core of the winter, formed only in the deepest parts of an ice mountain covered in perpetual snow. In essence, it is an egg of a spirit. Given that Camilla is the flower that blooms in winter, there is no better flower pot for it than the ice crystal. As for the location of the avatar of Camilla, Mephisto informs Elric that it is probably in the Temple of Flowers somewhere in the north. Elric has only heard about the Temple of Flowers and stories, so he wonders if it really exists. Mephisto assures him that it does, but warns that a noisy guardian is protecting the temple. To get more information, Elric will have to look through the records in the Imperial Library for now. Elric becomes suspicious of Mephisto's unusually friendly behavior and wonders what he is plotting this time. He also notices that Mephisto's spirit form has become more vivid, raising further doubts. Mephisto acknowledges that Elric has observed his power returning, but he taunts Elric, asking what he can possibly do even if he's aware of it. Elric understands that he has no choice but to become stronger through the assignments, but he also realizes that in doing so, he inadvertently strengthens Mephisto as well. Elric begins to worry that he might be unintentionally aiding the revival of a great demon king who could bring distress to the world. However, Mephisto finds amusement in Elric's concern, and then a smile forms on Elric's face as he realizes that he can turn the tables. For Mephisto to regain his full power and escape from Elric's grasp, Elric himself needs to grow stronger. So, he decides that he can take even more from Mephisto. Elric decides that he has completed everything he needed to do in the underground and should head back up. Climbing out of the hole he had jumped into a month ago now feels like a piece of cake compared to the challenging descent. Mephisto can't help but notice Elric's egoistic nature shining through once again. Elric contemplates finding a guide and considers heading to where the Crimson Eye Tribe resides. He's unsure whether it's because of his recent conflicts with the Yetis or because of his newly acquired seal from the Ice Mountain King, but he feels an urge to visit them. Upon arrival, Elric is shocked to find the entire tribe brutally murdered, seemingly for someone's cruel entertainment. Mephisto remarks that the perpetrator must possess a nature far more atrocious than most demons, but he doesn't know who could have done such a heinous act. Elric acknowledges that Yetis are monsters and can die at any moment and although he has killed many in the past, he has never treated them as mere playthings. Despite this, he feels an unsettling emotion, likely stemming from having swallowed the Ice Mountain King. 
Alaric reminds himself to remain composed because he is not the Ice Mountain King, and he has no right to feel sympathy for the Yetis. As Alaric starts to dig through the snow, he makes a heartbreaking discovery. The lifeless body of Mingma, the kid who used to share stories with them. The memories flood back, and Elric's anger grows as he realizes that this tragedy is the doing of the same people who attacked earlier. Seeking reassurance from Mephisto, he asks if his thoughts are correct, and Mephisto confirms that he is right. Frustrated, Elric wonders why they are making him feel so miserable. The young lady who previously led the tribe is now on the move, with Chen and his men trailing behind. Unfortunately, she trips and falls prompting Chen to approach her and inquire about her well-being. She assures him that she's fine and urges him not to worry, emphasizing the ongoing threat of assassins. They must stay focused on finding the grave they seek. Chen advises her to take a rest, but she insists on not being a burden any longer, revealing that many lives have been lost because of those pursuing her. She feels a responsibility to keep going and cannot afford to collapse at this point. Despite searching for the grave for a whole month, it remains elusive, and she feels disheartened about her inability to wield a sword properly, despite being the daughter of the legendary Blue Lion. Isabel hails from the prestigious Blue Lion Vile family, but she feels inadequate due to her lack of talent. People often mock her, claiming she can't even wield a sword properly, and that the future of the Vile family appears grim with her as an offspring. Doubts fill her mind, and she questions whether she truly deserves to be called a child of the Blue Lion. One night, beneath the shimmering stars and a full moon, Isabel's father, Blue Lion Herman Vile, calls her, and she turns to face him. Herman sincerely apologizes for burdening her with such expectations. Despite her resistance, Isabel blames herself, feeling she isn't skilled enough to live up to her father's legacy. Herman reassures her that she doesn't have to follow in his footsteps as the Blue Lion, emphasizing that she is still a valued member of the Vile family. In a light-hearted manner, he tries to lift her spirits by showing off his strong biceps and playfully asking her to touch them. Isabel teasingly responds that he's merely flaunting his armor. Herman initially tells Isabel not to worry about her father, but he quickly corrects himself and says not to worry about the Blue Lion, referring to himself, Herman Vile. However, with tears welling up in her eyes, Isabel makes a solemn vow to persistently pursue her dream of becoming the finest swordsman on the continent. Some time later, Herman is confined to his bed and remains unconscious. Concerned, Isabel approaches the doctor and inquires about her father's condition. The doctor explains that his symptoms are akin to those of a disease known as blockage disease. The doctor reveals that Herman's mana flow has become unstable due to reckless aura usage, and if left unattended, his muscles will deteriorate. Restoring his mana flow is essential, but it's a challenging task with human abilities, given the excess mana possessed by the Blue Lion. Isabel faces a difficult decision and realizes she must rely on a magic tool to save her father. Desperate for a solution, Isabel seeks an advanced magic tool possessed by the Magic Tower or Academy. However, their tools prove inadequate for her father's treatment. Despite tirelessly searching the entire continent, she finds no clues to aid him. Then, one day, she overhears a conversation about the grave of a king who ruled the Ice Mountain and the Yeti Highlands. Rumors suggest that the grave may be filled with treasures, including magic tools inaccessible to humans. As the individuals discuss the possibility of robbing the grave, Isabel cautions them about the danger of facing Yetis and advises against pursuing a mere myth. Ignoring their greed, she urges them to continue drinking instead. Driven by hope, she conducts extensive research on the grave, eventually discovering its existence and even uncovering a potential location. The situation takes a dire turn when news of Isabel's pursuit of the king's grave reaches her cunning uncle Paul Vile. Paul has been eagerly waiting for an opportunity to claim the seat of the Blue Lion, and upon learning of Isabel's plans, he dispatches assassins to eliminate her, the rightful successor. As Isabel stands amidst the Yeti Highlands, she ponders the depths of her uncle's malevolence. In the midst of this tense situation, Chen raises an alarm, urging Isabel to hide. Before she can comprehend the unfolding events, one of her companions swiftly pulls her to safety, concealing her from sight. The Blue Wolf 6th Unit, a group of elite knights secretly raised by Paul, approaches them. Their leader, Hanel, informs Chen that they have been relentlessly searching for Isabel and her companions. Hanel asserts that since Isabel is still a member of the Vile family, 
they will dispose of her swiftly. He presumes that Isabel must be nearby, leading Chen to retaliate and vow to avenge the lives of Isak and Zard with Hanel's life. Isabel's companion desperately urges her to flee and not look back, but she resolutely refuses, determined to go and save Chen. However, her companion firmly grabs her arm, insisting that they won't be able to overpower the knights. Isabel, worried for Chen's safety, implores her companion to release her, arguing that Chen's life is in jeopardy. But he reminds her that Chen is sacrificing himself to buy them time to escape, questioning if she intends to disregard his noble sacrifice. Hanel's voice echoes, calling out for Isabel and taunting her about the impending demise of her loyal servant, Chen. He tempts her to come out, knowing she can't bear to see him die. In response, Chen bravely claims that Isabel has already fled. Hanel, trying to provoke her, remarks on Isabel's apparent heartlessness for abandoning Chen. Hanel threatens to behead Chen, prompting Isabel to emerge from hiding with tears streaming down her face. She shouts at Hanel, reminding him that she is his true target. In an act of self-sacrifice, she implores him to spare Chen's life and take hers instead. Hanel offers a brief apology, but firmly states that it won't change his orders. He reveals that he has been commanded to eliminate anyone related to or who has witnessed the incident. Regretfully, he remarks that if Isabel hadn't run, everyone could have remained alive, leading happy lives with their families. When Hanel expresses his pity, Isabel comes to a painful realization that her actions inadvertently caused the deaths of innocent people. Hanel insists that they put an end to this, preparing for a confrontation. However, their focus shifts as someone approaches the scene and Hanel wonders who this person is. The person quickly casts a spell called Transform and casually responds, claiming to be a mere passing Satan. Elwick had previously been tasked with perfecting the winter season after completing his initial assignment. However, just as he was preparing to depart from the Ice Mountain, he stumbled upon a grim sight. The Yetis and humans had been ruthlessly slaughtered. Meanwhile, Isabel embarked on a quest to find the Ice Mountain King's grave, hoping to cure her father's ailment. Unfortunately, she found herself pursued by her uncle Paul Vile's hired assassins, the Blue Wolves. In a moment of peril, Elric swiftly transformed himself and interceded between Isabel and the assassins, introducing himself as a passing Satan. In response, Hanel expresses skepticism, questioning the significance of being a Satan and dismissing it as some kind of avant-garde nonsense. He taunts Elric, stating that he could have lived if he had simply kept on passing by. As Elric lands on ground using magic, Hanel is taken aback and demands to know who he is. However, Elric's landing isn't as smooth as he'd hoped, and he trips and falls on the snow. Despite this, he shows concern for Isabel's well-being and asks if she's all right. She assures him that she is, but in return, she wonders if Elric is all right after his fall. Elric assures her that he's perfectly fine. Observing Elric's somewhat awkward landing, Hanel's curiosity grows, and he wonders if magicians typically land like that, and why isn't he getting back up? His companion suggests that Elric might simply be embarrassed by the fall. Elric, meanwhile, feels a little disappointed that his entrance wasn't more impressive due to the snow. Isabel recognizes Elric as the person who disappeared from their tribe a month ago. Worried for his safety, she urges him to run away as the situation doesn't concern him. However, Hanel is determined to leave no witnesses and orders his knights to eliminate Elric. Unperturbed, Elric casts his gust spell, swiftly eliminating the knights. Both Isabel and Chen are left baffled by the sudden turn of events. Hanel insists on killing Elric quickly, preventing him from chanting spells. A knight strikes at Elric with a sword, but Elric deftly dodges and questions who gave permission for that attack. He retaliates with his penetrate spell, overpowering the knight's defense and causing them to cry out for help. Hanel demands to know Elric's identity and questions if he is aware of the knight's true identity. In his transformed state, Elric dismisses their identities, showing no concern and instructs them to bow down before him. Infuriated, Hanel grits his teeth and declares his intention to kill Elric. Isabel is astonished by the ease with which this unknown man is overpowering the Blue Wolves, but she realizes the urgency of the situation. Recognizing Elric's incredible power as a magician, she also senses the danger of being too close to him. As the battle unfolds, Elric engages in combat with Hanel, utilizing his magic spell's armament reinforcement and shootout. Hanel taunts Elric questioning if he truly believes he can defeat Hanel with mere magic. 
Unfazed, Ulrich confidently asserts that this will be the end and employs his shootout spell once more, causing Hanel to freeze in place. Hanel is perplexed by the ice surrounding him, which refuses to break. Elric taunts him, questioning if he comprehends what truly matters, and warns that his head will soon be buried in the ground. Isabel is in disbelief, witnessing how effortlessly this mysterious man decimated the Blue Wolves. She marvels at the existence of such a powerful magician on this hillside, and wonders how someone as young as Isabel herself could possess such extraordinary abilities. Isabel even contemplates if he might be on par with Tasha Narister, one of the three new stars. Curiosity consumes her as she tries to fathom the identity of this enigmatic man, contemplating if she should be familiar with him already. Elric lets out a relieved sigh and fondly remembers Mingma, wishing for him to rest in peace. Mephisto, on the other hand, notices that Isabel and her companions are observing Elric with unease and asks why he isn't saying anything to them. He jokes that their stares are so intense that even the back of his head hurts. This realization confuses Elric as he hadn't considered the impression he was leaving. With a slight awkwardness, Elric clears his throat and turns to face Isabel, breaking the silence. He remarks that it has been a while since they last met. Mephisto points out to Elric that Isabel and her group are staring at him with unease, and he humorously comments on how their intense gazes are even making the back of his headache. Feeling a bit embarrassed, Alric clears his throat and turns to face Isabel, acknowledging that it's been a while since they last met. Chen remains cautious despite Elric's assistance, viewing him as a stranger and believing it's too early to let their guards down. He can't dismiss the possibility that Alric might have ulterior motives, and he considers him just as dangerous as the assassins they encountered earlier. Isabel kneels down to express her gratitude to Elric, leaving her companions astonished at the gesture. Elric, feeling a bit overwhelmed, tries to downplay his actions, stating that he only did what anyone else would have done. Nonetheless, Isabel insists that Chen and Ed also show their appreciation, and they, too, kneel before Elric to offer their thanks. This further embarrasses Elric, who urges them to stand, emphasizing that he was only doing what he felt was right. Standing up, Isabel hesitantly requests a favor from Elric, acknowledging that it might sound peculiar. Elric informs her that he has other commitments and places to be. However, Isabel firmly holds his hand and insists on commissioning him for the task. Soon, they find themselves sitting inside a carriage, together with Chen. During their conversation, Elric notices the valuable gold coin of the blue lion that Isabel gave him. He asks if she belongs to the whale family, to which Isabel reluctantly admits. Elric realizes that Isabel is none other than the famed scentless flower Isabel Whale known for her exceptional beauty that even a crown prince once sought in marriage. However, she was ultimately abandoned due to being considered talentless, like a lion's flesh and blood without sharp teeth and claws. Elric learns that Isabel had been living in solitude after her engagement was broken off. Elric introduces himself as Rick to Isabel and expresses that it's an honor to meet the only daughter of the Blue Lion. Isabel, feeling unworthy of such admiration, asks him why meeting her would be considered an honor. Alric reassures her, saying it's perfectly fine to have confidence, and he has heard of her tenacity, which does justice to the name of the Blue Lion. Isabel blushes with gratitude at his kind words. She then requests Alric's assistance in escorting them to the Imperial capital. Chen quietly reminds her that they haven't found the grave yet, but she is concerned about their safety and doesn't want to endanger them further due to her own desire. So, she decides to meet her uncle and negotiate with him first. Elric notices the word uncle and ponders if the knights they encountered earlier are also part of the whale family, hinting at potential internal struggles within the family. He recalls hearing about the blue lion's illness, the reflux disease, which is similar to the blockage disease. A thought occurs to him that he could use this situation to create a debt of gratitude from the blue lion towards him. The alliance of the revived Mervinger and the Blue Lion would indeed be a remarkable sight. Isabel proposes to Elric that while she may lack to borrow the skills he possesses, she would like to reward him twice as much as she offered earlier upon completing their journey. Elric remains silent for a moment, causing Isabel to assume he cannot accept the offer. However, to her surprise, Elric takes her hand and assures her that he will gladly escort her. Mephisto questions Elric's need for money, mentioning the wealth in Shinake's nest. 
Elric explains that he has a plan and asks Mephisto not to make assumptions as he knows what it's like to be cold and hungry with no money. He reminds Mephisto that while it may not matter to a ghost like him, humans require money for basic needs like food and shelter. Mephisto jests that this is one of the typical human problems. Anyways, Elric remarks that the sound convection ability is quite convenient as it allows him to communicate with others using only a small amount of mana. Mephisto playfully responds that he taught Elric this skill because he was tired of him staying silent whenever others were present. Elric teases Mephisto, understanding why the chatty ghost disliked being mute and jokingly calls him a chatterbox. As they continue their journey in the carriage, Elric sits across from Isabel, looking out of the window without saying much. Isabel observes him and wonders if Elric's silence is due to her commissioning him. However, she realizes that she truly needs his help at this moment, especially if her uncle decides to send even stronger blue wolves after them. She understands that they won't stand a chance against such formidable adversaries. In his castle, Isabel's uncle, Hall, inquires about the elimination of Squad 6. One of the squad members, who managed to escape, kneels before him and apologizes. Paul responds by questioning why the squad member is sorry if he should not have done anything to warrant an apology in the first place. He then turns to Hilton, the leader of the Blue Wolf squad, asking for his opinion on how Isabel will proceed. They have confirmed traces of her leaving the Ice Mountain, and Paul assumes she will likely return to the Imperial capital. Hilton agrees, stating that negotiating with Paul is the most probable course of action for her. Paul expresses disdain, calling Isabel a stupid and incompetent child for daring to negotiate with him. He then issues a direct order to Hilton, giving him only one chance to deal with Isabel. Ed, fulfilling his role as the coachman, brings the carriage to a stop and informs Isabel that they have arrived at Le Centin. Isabel realizes how stiff and exhausted she feels after traveling continuously for two days without rest. Mephisto remarks to Elric that his body is aching all over, to which Elric playfully mocks him, asking how a ghost can experience physical discomfort. He suggests that Mephisto should have known the importance of maintaining a correct posture to ease the mind, questioning why he stayed upside down for so long. Looking out from the carriage window, Isabel notices the presence of Gather, the Blue Wolf Squad too, stationed at the entrance of Lacent on Hilton's orders. And when Hilton was questioned that whether it's necessary to mobilize their most powerful squad for something seemingly trivial, Hilton responded that Isabel's return to the capital is akin to a declaration of surrender, and thus they must act accordingly. Believing that she will likely pass through Lacent on her way from the Ice Mountain to the Imperial capital, Hilton ordered the squad to turn Lacent into their graves. Isabel had expected that their movements would be restricted due to the authority governing the area, but she was taken aback by the extent of the restrictions. Ed asks if they should turn back, but Isabel decides against it, realizing that it would only draw more suspicion if they retreat now. She suggests abandoning the carriage and moving on foot to find another one secretly. However, before she can finish her sentence, Elric intervenes, stating that there's no need for that. Elric employs his display spell, and they are able to pass through Lacent without any hindrance. Intrigued by his magic, Isabel asks him what kind of spell he used. Elric explains that it was a simple illusion magic that temporarily alters their appearance. However, he cautions that it can be easily broken with even the slightest shock, so they must remain cautious during their journey. Isabel expresses her gratitude to Elric for safely bringing them into the city. Elric suggests that they stay the night there while he takes care of some personal matters. He assures them that he will return soon before walking away. Mephisto questions Elric's decision to use illusion magic instead of directly confronting their enemies. Elric explains that he didn't want to engage in a fight without knowing the strength of their adversaries. Additionally, he needs to conserve his mana for potential emergencies. Mephisto jests that Elric should utilize his soul speech and seal's abilities more suggesting that he might just be lazy. Elric doesn't respond to Mephisto's taunt. Anyways, Mephisto inquires if Elric should head to the academy or wherever soon. Elric confirms that he indeed plans to do so, but he mentions that he has something specific to find first, particularly information about his dean, so he can strategize accordingly. Mephisto remarks that he doesn't know who Elric's dean is, but he considers him unlucky to be targeted by Elric. Mephisto raises a question mentioning that he felt something similar to mana from those knights. 
Elric reflects on this and realizes that the concept of aura chain probably didn't exist in Mephisto's timeline. Curious, Mephisto asks Elric to explain what aura chain is. Elric proceeds to explain that aura chain is a simple concept where mana, initially a blessing bestowed upon mages, has also been utilized by martial artists. Mages use mana circles in their hearts to cast magic, whereas martial artists weave aura chains around their dancians, the area of the body where IQ slash energy accumulates. Much like how mages have ranks such as 6th circle magus, 7th circle archmage, and 8th circle sage, martial artists are categorized by their aura chain ranks, including 1st chain user, 2nd chain advanced, 3rd chain expert, 4th chain master, and 5th chain superior. Lady Isabel's knights have an aura chain rank at the user level. Mephisto inquires if there are only five knights. Elric confirms that it is the usual number, with a rare exception being a person who has formed more than five chains. When asked who this person is, Elric reveals that it's the Golden Lion, considered the strongest being on the continent. Mephisto dismisses the nickname as arrogant, stating it's just a human standard. Elric counters that it's not the case. The Golden Lion was formidable even able to match Elric's own grandfather. Mephisto expresses a desire to meet the Golden Lion someday. Upon reaching a newspaper shop, Elric reads about his dean and realizes that the old man is still preoccupied with something. He decides not to bother with him, as what's more important for him is whether he should buy a month's worth of newspapers to catch up on the events that occurred during his absence. At the academy, the dean inquires if the matter still hasn't been taken care of. Rivern, while kneeling, apologizes and explains that the Narristers have tightly guarded the hospital, making it impenetrable. However, the Dean's achievement of discovering the nest is being highly praised by the Academy circles and the press, resulting in superior approval ratings for the Headmaster election. Nonetheless, the Dean is concerned about not obtaining the excavation rights for the nest and desires an overwhelming victory. Elric reassures the Dean, offering to put more pressure on the Narristers if given the command. On the other side, Carl, the spokesperson for the Narrister family, informs Seen that the pressure from the academic circles and the press for the transfer of the nest excavation rights is severe. He adds that this situation is akin to Seen betraying his supervising professor, causing uproar among the academic circles. Seen, with tears in his eyes, shares how his sister keeps reprimanding him every day, and Elric, whom he refers to as a bastard, hasn't contacted him even once. Nevertheless, Seen has decided to endure until Elric returns. Elric, reading about the situation with the Dean and Seen in the newspaper, realizes that the Dean remains as cunning as ever, and Seen is suffering due to Elric's actions. Looking at the Dean's photo, Elric remarks that the older the Dean gets, the more sly he becomes, appreciating his adept use of the press. He hopes the Dean continues to climb the ladder, as it will make Elric's debut even more spectacular. Elric then empathizes with Seen's plight and wonders if there's anything he can do to help him. Suddenly, a sharp golden light enters Elric's room through the window. Perplexed, he asks Mephisto where it's coming from. Mephisto informs him that it's the light of fire. Elric hears people outside calling for help to be saved. As Isabel, Chen, and Ed settle in for the night, Isabel sits at a table when Chen raises a question about her trust in Elric. Chen expresses his concern that while Elric may have saved them, there is still a possibility that he could be an assassin sent by other powerful figures, including the Seven Lions aiming for their main estate. Chen acknowledges that he cannot be certain, but he believes they must be cautious and prepared for any potential threat. Isabel understands Chen's protective instincts, especially after their experiences in the Ice Mountain. However, she reminds Chen that doubting Elric also implies doubting her judgment. She trusts Elric and believes that his demeanor reflects righteousness and honesty. Chen comprehends Isabel's point, but still raises the concern that Elric is ultimately a mercenary driven by monetary gain. Isabel suggests that Elric's actions were intentional. She explains that Elric helped them without expecting any payment from the beginning, indicating that he would have assisted them even without a commission. However, Chen recalls how Elric's demeanor changed as soon as they mentioned their affiliation with the Whale family. Isabel believes that Elric took her family's reputation into consideration and deliberately humbled himself to avoid tarnishing the name of the Blue Lion. Ed agrees, thinking that Elric likely did it to protect the image of the Blue Lion to not appear weak. 
Meanwhile, the leaders of the Blue Wolf squads, Simonin and Beskub, observe the burning city in the distance. Simonin remarks that the burning city is quite a sight and mentions the valuable scroll, the fourth circle advent of Heatwave, is worth the price they paid for it. Beskov expresses his concern, asking how Simonin can find amusement in such a situation. Simonin retorts that Beskov was just agreeing with him a moment ago and now acting serious. Showing something he holds in his hand, Simonin asks Beskov if he knows how much he spent on this item. He believes it's the best option, especially considering young Miss's personality. She would likely show up to help people regardless of the circumstances. Simon and that inquires about their next course of action. Beskov informs him that Squad 6 has been wiped out, and Hilton reports that three or more enemies remain unaccounted for, warning them to be cautious as there might be mages among them. Simon and brushes it off stating that even he could easily defeat the Squad 6 members with his eyes closed. He believes both Beskov and Hilton worry too much. Simon expresses his excitement to be entertained by strong opponents and instructs Beskov to help him find Isabel. Meanwhile, Isabel witnesses her people being burned, and her anger grows as she feels powerless to stop the destruction. She wants to confront the attackers head-on and save her people, but she lacks the strength and talent to do so. Despite the temptation to run away from the situation, she recalls Elric's words about her tenacity not shaming the name of the Blue Lion. Determined to become stronger, she reaffirms her identity as a member of the Whale family, the protector of the Empire. Even if it means risking her life, she is prepared to fight until the very end. Suddenly, the fire begins to extinguish, and snow starts covering the city. Isabel realizes they have been saved, and she wonders what is happening. Then, she sees Elric standing there. She contemplates the possibility of standing alongside Elric someday, even though she's unsure of how long it might take, or if it's even possible. Elric with fury and demands to know why knights are killing innocent civilians. Mephisto recognizes that the rage of the Mervinger is usually dormant but difficult to extinguish once it bursts forth. As someone who has faced them in the past, Mephisto knows this very well. Unlike regular humans who make mistakes when they lose their reason, the Mervingers become calmer, more merciless, and significantly stronger. Mephisto points out to Elric that there seem to be more of these powerful adversaries than the ones he faced last time. He inquires whether Elric thinks he can win against them. Elric responds, admitting that it will be difficult since he is unsure how long his mana will last, and he can't freely use magic among the civilians. However, Mavisto questions why he doesn't just run away. Elric explains that his family has a saying. Those with power have the obligation to prove themselves worthy of it. For this reason, the Mervingers have always been at the forefront of every war. Previously in the story, Isabel made the decision to negotiate with her uncle Paul Whale, and Elric, after accepting her request, chose to travel alongside her. However, due to Elric's actions, Paul Whale lost his subordinates, and, in response, sent the elite Blue Wolves to eliminate Isabel. This resulted in the entire city being engulfed in flames. Fueled by anger, Isabel was left with no choice but to draw her sword, even if it meant risking her life in the fight. Amidst the dire situation where death seemed inevitable, Elric suddenly appeared. As Isabel fought for her life, he intervened to save her from the perilous situation. Observing the city being rescued, Simonin remarked to Beskov that he had spent his hard-earned money on scrolls supposed to contain powerful four-circle magic. He wondered where this mysterious and powerful person came from. Could he be from the magic tower? He inquires of Beskov about what actions to take considering that causing trouble for the magic tower would be undesirable. Beskov responds, stating that he is familiar with all the mages in the magic tower, but he does not recognize Elric. Despite this uncertainty, they both agree to proceed with caution. Beskov decides that he will simply eliminate Isabel and withdraw. Simonin questions what they should do with the mysterious mage, Elric, interferes. Beskov gives a direct order to kill Elric in such a scenario. However, suddenly Isabel's strength wanes, and she collapses to the ground. Elric rushes to her side, taking her hand and swiftly leading her away. Witnessing their escape, Simon commands Squad 3 to pursue them. Elric realizes that over 40 knights are tailing them, and he needs to lead them away from populated areas. The knights surround him, so he lands alone on the ground. Simon taunts Elric, calling him a Dan Rat. He mentions being excited as it's his first time chasing a mage and demands to know where he has hidden the young miss, Isabel. 
Elric responds by sarcastically asking if Simonon expects him to give away that information, calling him dumb in the process. Elric points out that Simonon can't seem to do anything other than chase him. In retaliation, Simonon accuses Elric of courting death and commands his knights to bring him Elric's head. However, Elric had to use a significant amount of mana to extinguish the fire engulfing the city. Although the mana in the dragon heart increased substantially after absorbing the seal, Elric's body cannot endure exceeding his limits as it did in the past. He reflects that earlier he could simply restart after death, but now that won't be the case, he only has one chance to survive. Elric becomes aware that there is not just 30, but 40 knights surrounding him. He has heard that these knights go all out, even when confronting a lone opponent, just as Isabel warned him. Despite this, Elric decides to target their leader first. However, the knights swiftly attack him, forcing him down onto the ground with their swords piercing the ground around him. He realizes that his body isn't responding to his commands. Mephisto mocking him, questions whether he was truly able to defeat the Ice Mountain King. Elric insists that his body moved exactly as he willed it to back then. Mephisto retorts by asking if Elric seriously believed that the game laid out for him by Otto would translate the same way in reality. In response to Mephisto's taunts, Elric requests him to either be of help or remain silent. Simonon dismisses all of his knights and takes matters into his own hands, engaging Elric in close combat. He mocks Elric, referring to him as a foolish mage for resorting to physical combat. Simonon questions why Elric doesn't use the supposedly precious magic he showcased earlier. Elric grits his teeth and attempts to cast a spell, but Simonon swiftly blocks his attempt and taunts him, asking if that's all he's capable of. Simonon challenges Elric to entertain him further, but despite Elric's efforts, he fails to gain an advantage. Simonon smugly remarks that this is the consequence of Elric's evasive behavior, comparing him to a rat. He states that Elric is now trapped like a rat in a corner. Simonon launches an attack on Elric using a flare and declares that it's time to conclude the battle. Elric responds by asking if that's the best Simonon can do and creates a magic circle. He warns Simonon to stop with his deceitful tricks. Suddenly, Elric's eyes ignite with magical fire, leaving Simonon astonished at how a human could possess such eyes. Simonon orders his knights to eliminate Elric before he can fully activate his magic. One knight moves forward to attack, but Elric smirks at its audacity and questions if it truly intends to kill him. When Isabel fell, Elric quickly came to her aid and they fled together. Simonon instructed his knights to pursue them. Curious about the knight's fighting style, Elric asked Isabel how they fight. She explained that the knights use joint attacks to overwhelm and defeat their enemies, even when facing just one opponent. They operated like a pack of wolves, coordinating their efforts seamlessly. With this information, Elric formulated a plan to deal with them. He decided to lead the knights to the plaza and take them out all at once. Isabel suggested that a trap would be helpful, to which Elric agreed. He then asked for a favor from Isabel. Once she had evacuated the citizens from the plaza, she should destroy a particular signal magic scroll. Elric informed her that he intended to eliminate the threat once and for all. Elric casts his Surge Magic spell, freezing everyone who was there to attack him. He realizes that magic circles are indeed excellent for conserving mana. Simonon finds the situation impossible to comprehend. Elric questions Simonon, asking how foolish he must be not to have noticed that Elric was drawing a magic circle. Only Simonon's face remains unfrozen, and Elric extends his hand towards him. Simonon pleads for Elric to stay away. Elric coldly informs him that he won't have a peaceful death. Meanwhile, Beskov sneaks up behind Elric and warns him that his luck has run out. Beskov realizes that Elric lured them all into close combat to annihilate them with a magic circle, a feat that would be impossible without precise calculations and confidence. As Elric smiles, Beskov notices and realizes that Elric was aware they were watching him from their hiding spot. However, Beskov dismisses this thought, convinced that Elric couldn't have sensed them, as he would have avoided using the magic circle first. Attempting to negotiate, Beskov tells Elric that he will spare his life if he hands over the young miss, Isabel. Elric retorts, questioning Beskov's proposal and asserting that he has no intention of sparing Beskov's life. Ignoring Elric's warning, Beskov tries to attack him, but Elric reminds him that there will be no mercy for knights who have abandoned their codes. 
Besco takes out his sword and instructs his knights to protect their bodies with aura and maintain their formation. Elric casts his blunt spell, but unfortunately, his rust curse magic isn't working. He then uses his blow away spell and notices that his resounding storm spell has also weakened significantly. Elric wonders if it's due to the seal of cruelty, causing all non-ice attribute magic to decrease in power. Elric contemplates whether he needs to obtain seals of matching attributes to effectively use them. He then wonders if it is easy to use the seal of cruelty. However, he quickly realizes that it is actually absurdly difficult. Unlike the ice mountain brimming with ice energy, the seal of cruelty can't unleash its full power in the middle of the city and consumes a significant amount of mana. Nevertheless, Elric acknowledges that there might still be a way to overcome these challenges. Elric decides to cast his rush spell. In response, Beskov orders his knights to block it. Despite the opposition, Besko tries to attack Elric with his sword. Fed up with the games, Elric tells him it's enough and assumes a hand posture to cast another spell. Beskov, growing impatient, informs Elric that he has no more time to play games and intends to put an end to this confrontation. He commands all of his knights to attack, but to his surprise, Beskov himself gets frozen. He wonders how this happened. Elric reveals that his ice magic carries a deadly poison that freezes the target upon even the slightest touch. Besko's mistake was attempting to block the attack instead of evading it. He admits that he has never encountered a curse magic like this before. Elric casually explains that all he did was infuse a curse into his ice magic. Beskov realizes that even the captain of the first squad made a grave error. He wishes that captain hadn't sent only them to deal with Elric. While acknowledging Elric's incredible abilities, Beskov warns him that he will soon regret crossing paths with them. Despite being unable to talk due to being frozen, Beskov manages to convey that Elric's demise will come at the hands of the first squad captain. Elric sarcastically asks if it's the first squad captain who orchestrated this plan. Beskov remains frozen and unable to respond. Elric coldly informs him that he won't be alone on his journey to hell and promises that the first squad captain will soon follow. A group of knights who manage to escape the battle approach their captain. They hand him a scroll infused with a powerful six-circle magic called Fire Bridle. They inform him that they, the Blue Wolves, the loyal swords of Head Paul Whale, who is destined to become the next Blue Lion, cannot retreat in shame. The captain responds by urging them to run, run until they have rashes on their feet, to set everything ablaze, and if that's not enough, to even set themselves on fire and keep running. He emphasizes that it doesn't matter if the young miss, Isabel, dies. The captain instructs them to sacrifice their lives to reduce the entire city to ashes. The Blue Wolves, the loyal swords of Head Paul Weil, who is destined to become the next Blue Lion, cannot simply flee with their tails between their legs, can they? The captain sternly commands them to run, run, and run until their feet are covered in rashes. He urges them to set everything ablaze, and if that's still not enough, they should even set themselves on fire and keep running. To him, it doesn't matter if the young miss, Isabel, dies. The captain insists that they must be willing to sacrifice their lives to turn the city into a pile of ash. Mephisto comments to Elric that it seems like they are attempting something insane. According to Mephisto, the only race crazier than demons are humans. No matter how sophisticated they may appear, this is the true face of their race. Elric observes that only three blue wolves are left. One of them is not in his line of sight, but the more pressing concern is the powerful magic scroll they possess, which seems to be at least six circle in strength. A single mistake, and the entire city could turn into a raging inferno. The captain wonders if Elric can stop this potential catastrophe, though he knows it may already be too late. Suddenly, Isabel swiftly cuts off Captain Simonon's hand with her sword. Elric admires her fearlessness, mentioning that he had sensed it since their time on the Ice Mountain. Elric acknowledges that Isabel used the item he gave her to escape, and he marvels at how effective the stealth scroll has proven to be. He jokingly remarks that the A-plus he received in the scroll production class was well worth it. The scroll has indeed worked wonders in helping Isabel execute her escape. Holding his sword in the other hand, Simon and launches an attack on Elric, exclaiming die. But Elric swiftly uses his spell to free Simonin as well. Elric remarks to Simonin that he is putting up quite a fight, questioning why he resists so vehemently when he knows he is destined to die anyway. Elric taunts Simonin, 
commenting on his disfigured face. Elric admits to feeling tired and suggests they end this confrontation. However, Simonon retorts by asking if Elric thinks it's all over. He reminds Elric of the other two blue wolves and informs him that while Elric was occupied with him, his subordinates must have completed their preparations. Simonon boasts about the blue wolves' loyalty to their liege and how they never fail. Despite having lost to Elric, Simonon warns that this place will soon become a hell filled with screams. However, Elric calmly informs him that he has already taken care of his subordinates. Shocked, the frozen Simonon is left speechless. Elric reminds Simonon that he was the one who had asked him to use the magic that Elric is so proud of earlier. He informs Simonon that even his final trump card is now gone. At that moment, Isabel approaches them. Simonon starts pleading with her, promising that if she spares his life, he will speak highly of her to head Paul Whale. Isabel reveals that their original orders were to frighten her a little and escort her to Paul. Simonon boasts about his position as the third squad captain, believing that Paul will listen to him. However, Isabel firmly asks Simonon to stop bringing shame to the Whale family. In one swift motion, she removes Simonon's head from his body with her sword. She apologizes to Elric for her actions, stating that she lost her temper. Elric reassures her, mentioning that he was going to leave Simonon to her anyway, so it's all good. He then asks if she is hurt anywhere. Isabel assures him that she is all right, although her body might be in shock. Elric suggests that she waits for a moment, but before he can finish his sentence, Isabel interrupts and asks if he could spare one of the Blue Wolves' lips. Isabel opens up about her past experiences, expressing that she has never felt this way before. The knights from her family always kept their distance from her, considering her talentless. Even if they showed respect, it was solely because she is the daughter of the Blue Lion. There was nothing more to it. As for her Uncle Paul's Blue Wolves, they would sometimes show respect, but at other times, they would stare at her with disdainful and chilling eyes. She could feel their contempt towards her. However, now, those very wolves are filled with fear, afraid of her. They decide to spare one of the blue wolves and use him as a messenger to deliver a message to her uncle that the position of Blue Lion will never be his. In truth, the knights are more afraid of Elric than her. Isabel wishes she had power and talent like Elric, but she quickly reminds herself that she can't keep lamenting forever. She realizes that to gain power, she must change her weak attitude and take action to improve herself. Elric inquires about Isabel's plans now that the immediate danger has passed. She informs him that she will head to Carnoy, where her father is recuperating, to strategize for the future. Elric wonders if she intends to increase her forces. Isabel affirms that she will try to seek help from her father's old friends who owe him debts of gratitude. Elric praises her decision, stating that no one would dare touch a place protected by the Blue Lion. Isabel reflects privately that this would be true if her father is there. However, she worries that if he doesn't wake up, the battle ahead will be difficult to win. She considers that she might have a chance if Sir Rick helps her, but she knows that a lion cannot associate with mages. Moreover, she is already indebted to Sir Rick, and she doesn't want to further burden him. Isabel doesn't want to part ways with Elric, but she realizes that it's time to say goodbye here. Elric presents a few papers to Isabel, urging her to take them. Curious, Isabel asks what they are. Elric humbly admits that he might be presumptuous, but he has heard that the illness the Blue Lion is suffering from is similar to blockage disease. He goes on to say that he's not entirely certain if it will be helpful, but the papers contain a potential cure for blockage disease. Isabel is taken aback by this. As Isabel looks at the papers, she asks Elric about their content, wondering if they are a thesis. Elric then seeks her forgiveness for his audacity and reveals that he has heard the Blue Lion's illness resembles the blockage disease. He goes on to explain that he is uncertain if the papers will be helpful, but they contain a potential cure for the blockage disease. Isabel appears confused by what he's saying. Elric decides to come clean and apologize for concealing his identity. He dispels the transformation spell, revealing his true self as Elric Melbinger the head of the Melbinger family, and the Radiant Star Duke. He elaborates on the significance of the title Radiant Star, which is a peerage granted to Ustin Mervinger, known as the Magus of the Star, after his victory in the war against demons. The title symbolizes the radiance he displayed on the battlefield, and though it holds no inherent power, it is a prestigious and illustrious peerage that represents radiant glory.
Isabel inquires if Elric means that he is the one who should be in a coma at the Imperial Magic Hospital. Elric admits that he has certain circumstances he cannot reveal, but it is true that he was suffering from the blockage disease until recently. He explains that the papers she is holding contain a treatment he developed after researching his own body following his recovery. Since the Blue Lion's illness is similar to the blockage disease, the treatment should be of some help. Elric reminds Isabel of her vow to seek vengeance against those who tormented her. He hints that it would be unfortunate if the Blue Lion were to go missing during such a crucial moment. Overwhelmed with emotion, Isabel's eyes well up with tears. She expresses her gratitude and wonders how she can ever repay such kindness. Elric gently pats Isabel's head and assures her not to worry about it, as he plans to receive his fair share of repayment from her in due time. Isabel expresses her desire to repay even a fraction of the kindness shown to her by helping Sir Rick, or rather, Sir Elric this time. She asks if he would like her to turn him into a hero. Meanwhile, a city rescue program has commenced for the civilians. Mephisto raises concerns about Elric revealing his identity like this. Elric explains that Paul will undoubtedly search for him, considering the number of blue wolves he has defeated. Paul is the kind of person who detests losing. Moreover, Elric's unique magic would eventually expose his identity, especially if he causes a commotion at the academy. Mephisto inquires if Elric plans to set the stage himself, as his identity is likely to be exposed one way or another. Elric acknowledges that helping the Blue Lion will indeed be beneficial for the future revival of the Merbinger family. Mephisto points out that Elric is not just creating a spotlight for himself, but also laying a solid foundation. He admits that he previously only considered Elric's talent in magic, but now he sees that Elric also possesses a talent for strategy. Amidst the rescue efforts, a civilian mother holding her baby approaches Elric and asks if he is leaving already. She requests him to stay a little longer. Politely declining her offer, Elric explains that he has already stayed with them for too long and encourages them to return to their daily lives. The grateful mother expresses her thanks to him, emphasizing that if it weren't for his intervention in defeating the wrongdoers, their situation would have been miserable. From behind, someone calls out to Elric and expresses gratitude, although unsure of how to properly convey it. Elric turns around to see Chen. Curious, Elric asks why Chen has been wearing such a melancholic expression lately. He reminds Chen that he was merely fulfilling his duty, and there was no need to be overly grateful. Chen places his hand on his chest and declares that as a knight of whale, he will never forget this favor. Elric feels touched but also overwhelmed, reiterating that Chen doesn't have to go to such lengths to express his gratitude. Unusedly, Mephisto playfully remarks to Chen, even though Chen cannot hear him, that Elric is only doing all this for the future money he will receive. Elric tells Mephisto to be quiet and then asks Chen about his plans for the future. Chen informs Elric that regardless of whether Paul Whale was behind the recent events, the Whale family is still responsible for the misdeeds. Therefore, he pledges to assist the people affected by the situation until the very end, and he considers it his duty as a noble to accompany young Miss to Carnery. Mephisto dismissively summarizes Chen's plan, considering it a mere justification and a means to rouse public sentiment. Meanwhile, Paul Whale's notoriety will continue to spread. Mephisto expresses surprise at the woman's cunning, finding her more clever than he initially thought from her innocent appearance. As Elric departs, the grateful civilians he saved wish him luck and extend their gratitude, urging him to visit again in the future. Elric turns to Mephisto and suggests they pay a visit to the Dean. Meanwhile, in the Dean's office, the Dean instructs Riverin to acquire the excavation rights no matter what, even if it means dealing with the Narrister family. The dean expresses frustration with Seen Narrister getting in his mentor's way and declares that he will never allow Seen to set foot in the academy. The dean orders Riverin to find any means necessary, including using the press or bribing higher-ups, to secure the rights. Riverin promptly leaves the office to carry out the orders. With only three days left until the headmaster election, the dean is desperate to obtain the excavation rights. A mysterious figure is present in his office. The dean asks if the figure is willing to cooperate with him, inquiring if he has made a decision to finally collaborate. 